much. Now that yes, sir. Uh, share that Mr. Marcanio pointed out the website just came up. I can't promise that it's going to stay up, but it is up right this minute. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome to our workshop Thursday. Thank you for those that are here. Uh, we're going to um, adjust the agenda for a very special event. Uh, I want to uh, ask Mr. Smith to uh, come to the podium. And Mr. Smith is the son, and uh, you can right there right now, uh, of Mrs. Leola Smith, who on July the 4th became, celebrated her 99th birthday, and she's also has served as the, uh, uh, a teacher and librarian for 35 years in the district. So. You want to go ahead and explain this, and, and uh, we morning. appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for the invitation, and good morning, uh, board, and everyone here. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to stand in for my dear mother, my blessed mother, who by grace is still here, knows who she is, where she is, and who she is. <laughs> uh, she has been uh, the driving force in the lives of my brothers and me. There are three of us. Um, we all graduated from high school. I came, this is my high school, folks. This is my high school, 1965. Uh, Playing football across the street over there. Right. Before you, you put that bill in there. Uh, but uh, mother used to ride, bum a ride as a child from Warrington up to the, Lizzie James, uh, the uh, Lily James School up here on Martin Luther King. Now the General Chappie James's Museum. Uh, later, uh, but you did not get to school because, on, often because the rider, well, the driver of the car, if he went fishing or hunting, she was out of <laughs> school days and couldn't get to school. Nobody else in the community had a car but Mr. Cole. She ultimately had to ride the subway, the Bayshore Line, up to school, Building 31, I think it was. But she eventually graduated from Washington Senior High School over on Strong, which was a brand new school, in 1940. After that, uh, she did two years at FAMC, Florida a &M College, got a c teaching certificate, came back, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was able to work at the Navy Yard for a bit, but she ended up in Gaston County, where she worked uh, in junior high, at the junior high level. Uh, she eventually got married, had three sons. My dad's an Omaha Beach veteran, disabled veteran. He's dead now. but. Uh, she ended up getting a BS degree in 1950 from Florida a &M University, and she got hired. She used to go to the school board to get a substitute position. She'd go every morning, sit down, and wait to see if a position would open up. She was very diligent in that, and Mrs. E. V. Pickens at Spencer Bibbs hired her. She got in the classroom. She taught fourth grade, second grade, I think a little first grade, and after that, she worked that long stretch, and then the board came up with the new idea to create Spencer Bibbs, a new construction entity, the one that stands now. She was invited to be the librarian by Mrs. Pickin, but she had to get her certification done. So on the weekends, she would be in a carpool driving to Tallahassee to get certified. She ended up with a master's in education with certification in library media special, specialist, as a media specialist. And uh, she ultimately retired in uh, May of 86, and uh, she ha has not looked back. She has tremendous memories of serving the Escambia County School Board and the youth of Pensacola, and her, leg her legacy lies with the progeny of all the folk who have taught, that she has taught. Um, amazing woman, I'm partial, uh, but uh, I'm thankful that you all afforded me the opportunity to receive this award for her. She is a blessed woman, and she's my dear mother. Thank you. Well, sir, that's incredible. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, I, I want to thank you on behalf of her for coming and pointing this out to us, because it's always great for us to hear the history of the Escambia County Schools and how things have were in the beginning. I mean, those stories are incredible to see how that the, the diligence and, and work that she did just to become a teacher. and. Uh, 
So you're very fortunate to have such a wonderful mother. And I'm sure we could probably hear stories for a, a long time about Omaha Beach, and I'd love to hear those, but that's we won't do that today. I have one significant one, and I'll tell you all side, okay? All right. One, okay. All right. So if, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, the board members to come forward, Mr. Smith, superintendent, and we're going to present this certificate so you can take this to your mother. Thank you. Mr. Smith, you said you graduated in 65 from Booker T? Yes, I did. Okay, because I've graduated in 66 from Pensacola High School. So we're not that far apart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so sir. Much. 68 at PHS. 68 at PHS, huh? He's the one that set this up. Well, tell him thank you very much for doing that. I would like to make one comment before he leaves. Yes, Mr. Smith. In, a, in addition to the accomplishments of your mother and the, and the three of you all, uh, I'd like for the audience to know that he married into a family of deltas. <laughs> uh -oh. He always has to put that in. And for this audience, being in Pensacola, the Navy is something I wanted to do. And I was blessed to serve 24 years on active duty. Wow. Hired 24 years ago as a captain, and uh, life is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we will begin our regular workshop. Uh, let's see, the opening thing was a calendar. So please look at the front, back, and other editions of the calendar. I have to figure out which page is where. Okay, that's... All right, we'll begin in July. Um... I would have to, I would like to say that uh, the superintendent and I met all day yesterday <laughs> as it down there on the 13th uh, that Tuesday excuse me right. Tuesday we <laughs> met all day as we traveled to Tampa and you'll hear more about that particular session later but uh, we were at the board of could I just take a moment of personal privilege just yes. to thank you, Ms. Oda, Mr. Wilson, uh, Mr. Mills, and Superintendent Smith. I watched that meeting, and um, um, the beginning before y'all got on was a very um, contentious part of the meeting, but I thought y'all did an amazing job, and I know it was a long trip, and um, I believe as board members, we, we owe you all a debt of gratitude because it was a well done, you, know, yeah. you didn't have much time to tell them everything they wanted to know. And um, I, I really appreciated your reinforcing that this board believes in taking care of those stu That's, students. Thank you very much. And I, I, I think Superintendent and I felt like it, that it was important for them to hear 
that the Escambia County School Board was 100% behind the superintendent, the principal, the uh, external operating group, and the students. We're not giving up on those students. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, it was a interesting time. Yes, I, I agree, and I thank you very much for well, thank you for that presentation. <clears throat> well, the pre yes, and uh, let's see, did did Mr. Wilson make it yet? <laughs> He's probably at his school. I bet well, you he's at the school. He's being probably principal. at his school. That's yeah. right. I forgot. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and the one thing the superintendent I have to thank Mr. Wilson is he loves to drive. That's yeah. That was very. And helpful. we let him. <laughs> That's right. Seven <laughs> hours down and seven hours back. So yeah. thank you very much. Um, there also, um, I think we got an email yesterday about the administrative conference. D did. Uh, I think Mr. Alabac sent us something about that, and I don't think it's on here yet because we just got notification. She probably ran this. Is that the 22nd? I think it's the 22nd. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Time and location. Booker it's at Booker T. Washington. Washington. Yes. <laughs> okay. And some things need to stop ringing. It starts at 8 or 9? 8. Okay. Okay, so eight o'clock at uh, in the auditorium at Booker T. There's no planning board workshop. Yeah. I will say I'm not going to be at the August planning board meeting. Um, I, I don't know whether anybody just wants to go and sit there, but um, I always look at the agenda and um, share it with Mr. Dennis. And if he sees that there's anything that we need to address, then he'll have somebody at the meeting. Uh, you can always watch it online. So, All right. And we have, of course, our board meeting on Tuesday night. I also want to call to your attention on the 22nd at 5 p.m., we have a mandatory advertised attentive bed budget meeting. I'm correct, Mr. St. Cyr? All right. That will be a lengthy meeting. If it lasts more than 10 minutes, somebody's going to be reprimanded. <laughs> but um, it's basically the beginning of the process of adopting the budget. The meeting, uh, the length of that next Thursday meeting will be longer than the tentative budget hearing which would follow because we want to make sure the board's well versed right give okay. some uh, discussion on some of the budget issues and so we'll be ready and prepared to answer any questions that Thursday okay thank you very much and we will be prepared to ask those questions all right, and if you will also notice that we have one on the 22nd and one on the 29th. All right, any questions or any additions for July? Turn the page over and let's move into August. Can you believe it? Teachers return on the 3rd. Betty has just announced she will not be at the planning board meeting, but Mr. Dennis will take care of anything needed there. Students return on the 11th of August. So be prepared. And then we, of course, will be back into our regular routine on workshops. The 12th will be at 3 p.m. And the 13th will be at 9 a.m. Um, I, I would like to be able to call in to the meetings on the 13th, uh, the Thursday and Friday. I will not be in, in town. Okay. Um, Ms. Buswell is making <coughs> a note of that. Mr. Chair. Mr. Fetzko, I hear you rattling the microphone over there. Well, on the uh, morning of the 14th. That's a Saturday. Never mind. That doesn't matter. We're good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. 17th is our next our August board meeting. Do we have any items we need to add 
<coughs> or discuss on the August calendar? I believe um, that the PTA leadership uh, conference is on the 14th of August. Yes, we don't do Saturdays, but on this map, but I believe it's on the 14th. I just wanted oh, okay. to be sure everybody was aware that they've been invited. To. That's what I was looking at and yeah. why I brought that date up. Yeah. Location and time? Um, I, the clock at the Pensacola State, State, State College Library. Yeah. And that's when they they start it, and you can are welcome to stay for any of the workshops. But they give you an opportunity to say hello and All right. join PTAs. Take your cash. <laughs> All right, moving on into September. Any questions on September? Okay. Um, since Superintendent and I had nothing else to do, we came up with a lot of things to talk about on our seven hours in the van. Um, one item is if you can look at your calendars in November. Yes. Good to get on there. And this is just a, a matter of information because of uh, the holiday, the th Thursday of our normal discussion workshop is a holiday. And we could move everything to Friday, but there are probably a few people that would like to have, that would like to take Thursday and Friday. So I would like to suggest, and the superintendent didn't think this would be a problem, but I'd like to get the reactions, that we move that work, those two workshops to the Monday before the meeting. Starting at nine o'clock. And that way, if people had more making plans to take a long weekend, they would not have to uh, destroy those plans. Mr. Superintendent, comment? I, I, I agree. I think that makes uh, for, a, for a higher attendance uh, for our meetings and probably for our listeners as well. Uh, who who tune in? I think we might be more likely to have more people tune in on the Monday. Okay. So, are we going to start at nine a.m.? Nine a.m. Okay. Any other, any comments? Any anybody with a problem doing that? I'd, I'd like to do it in advance, just because that gives everybody the same opportunity to <clears throat> be aware and make make their plans. Okay, so if we will notate that for the calendar. Yeah, that was my next, very good. So we will be having an organizational meeting at the board meeting. The date of the board meeting is the 16th, thank you. And so we will be having the organizational meeting, which would be the election of the new chair and vice chair and all the hugs and everything and congratulations that go along with that. <laughs> and uh, then we will uh, adjourn that meeting and begin the regular meeting at 530 with the new chair. Good? Absolutely. Five o'clock organizational meeting on the 16th of November and 5.30 regular school board meeting. And Ms. Buswell will be reminding us of that. She already did. <laughs> got it on our got calendar. Got invitation. Already got our invitation, all right. 
All right, anything else on the calendar? Good, all right. Let's move on into uh, any updates needed from the last uh, regular school board meeting on public forum. Mr. Chairman, we did have uh, a speaker from uh, Washington, Booker T. Washington High School on the uh, contact tracing. That person was contacted by uh, uh, Ms. Hannah, our health coordinator, so that situation was addressed. All right. Any other questions on public forum inf information from the last meeting? Excuse me. All right. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes. There, there was one other speaker, and that was uh, Ms. Warren, who spoke, uh, who addressed the board about having input on the use of our ESSER funding. And so I want to want to make sure that the board knows that we did reach out to um, the um, the union, and that meeting is scheduled for um, the 21st next week. So that was the follow up for that speaker. And and. I don't know if we want to get into it, much of it right now, but the the use of the ESSER funds is an ever-changing yes. item. Yes. Uh, not only for us, but for the state. Um, and sometimes you have to say, I'm not sure who knows what you can do. Mm -hmm. But we've been given information of what we cannot do. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something that will be in discussions probably at an executive session okay all right um this bus well put an item on here for us for uh, travel requests because of the new legislation that went into effect last year i believe two years ago two years ago yes. okay two years How ago time flies when you're having fun. Uh, yes, uh, we need to inform Ms. Buswell of travel that we might anticipate doing so she can put that on the August agenda for approval because you can't just travel. And this is just in-state at this time or do you want in-state and out-state? Okay. Both in-state and out-of-state. So, um, you need a list now you need you need it then no no you need when when do you want this information when's the when's the due date for the agenda yeah because you got to you got to get it on the agenda okay So by July 30th, please communicate with Ms. Buswell your intent to travel for the next school year. Any questions? Okay. And you will send us out our reminders to get that in. Thank you very much. Good. All right, now, Ms. Uh, Hightower? Uh, yes, I, I, as, I can presume that some of you fellow board members have been getting um, <coughs> emails and phone calls from uh, people wondering about the process for um, getting tickets for next year's sporting events. And I had a conversation with Ms. Morgan, and we decided it would be good to have that presentation, you know, what the district is pursuing, is going to proceed with. Um, I know a lot of employees um, expressed concerns last year because they were used to being able to use their ID badge to get in. And um, uh, so I'm going to let her talk about it. That way everybody hears it at the same time. Or who's going to talk about it? Somebody's going to talk about it um, so that we all know what's going on and, and people can, we can refer them to this video if they need some explanation. Video, oh, this video. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Morgan, now you're going to make an introduction. I am. 
Thank you. Casey Teeley is our new athletic director, replaced Roger Mayo when he left in May. So we've been working with Mr. Teeley, and so he's going to answer all your questions. He's going to tell you what we're doing and then answer any questions you have. So we welcome him to his first board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Welcome, and uh, give us some information there. Good morning. Uh, we, this last year, the 2021 school year, uh, because of COVID went cashless with our tickets. Okay, so uh, people would walk up to a basketball game, football game, there's a scan code there, they take their cell phone, they'd scan the code, they could pull up uh, the event, buy one, two, three tickets, et cetera. And then uh, would go to the ticket taker and do this. This was a great thing for our high schools. Even though we had only 50% uh, capacity, a lot of sports reported making more money bringing in more ticket sales, you know, with that, it was really good. We also, it was a safety issue, it was also a time issue by going digital with that. Okay, what do I mean by that? If we have a football game where we have 12, 15, 20, 25,000 dollars worth of cash gathered at that event, we would have a uniformed police officer escort uh, the cash. They'd go to have to go to the bank, they'd have to go to the vault in the school, whatever their protocol was, and deliver that. And it was worrisome. Basketball games where you have three, five, seven, eight thousand dollars. Again, we would have more than one person, a, dig a uniformed officer, escort it to the vault, put it in there. From a time standpoint, when we're dealing with cash, our bookkeepers for football would have four, five, six cash boxes. They would have to go to the bank, the bookkeeper would have to go to the bank, get the cash, come back, reconcile it, put it together, have the tickets. Then whoever assumes control of the ticket box would have to, again, count, make sure that the cash was accurate, the tickets. At the end of the night, the person that was turning in the cash box would have to recount everything. When the bookkeeper gets it the next day, they'd have to re that's all alleviated uh, with digital ticketing. Um, the GoFan is a company that we use. Uh, they make a direct deposit at 3 a.m. The, mor the morning after the uh, event. Nobody touches the cash. It goes directly in there from an auditing standpoint, from a safety standpoint. We're not dealing with cash. It's been very, very good. We did not, because of COVID and the 50% capacity, uh, allow employees to get a complimentary uh, pass to the events. Uh, so the athletic directors of the seven high schools met June 8th, and we are all for 100% to give our more than 5,000 employees a free ticket to every athletic event, one free ticket to every athletic event. They would look like the rest of the fans that are coming up. They would scan the code and say, I want one ticket. And then they'd enter their employee identification number, and that would give them the complimentary ticket at no charge. If they came up with their family, there was three of them, four of them, you know, they would, for the one, enter their employee ID number, they'd get the complimentary ticket, I need to buy three more tickets, done, turn them in, and, and uh, very straightforward, very safe, very time efficient, cost efficient for the school systems. And uh, we met uh, with the executive committee, I believe, June 28th, and, and uh, discussed that with them. And uh, they appear to be in support of that. So that's where we're at right now. Question, I, questions? I, I, um, comments? How are we rolling that out to the employees? Yeah, well, for, first of all, from, and again, new to the position, so making sure that communication is great, okay? So the athletic directors and the principals agree that this has been good. It's been presented to the executive board, they agree. Now it's been presented to you. So my timeline was if everything went well with this meeting, this is what we're gonna roll out. I will contact after this meeting, I'll contact the district. I need the active employee ID numbers, no other information. Uh, just the, the unique Escambia County School District employee number. They will upload that to GoFan so that when they enter their school ID number, they're good to go. I'll put together a, uh, just like a, on the, the uh, uh, Zoom meetings that we do, I'll just do a quick video with that. We can attach it to each high school uh, from that so they can see it on their sports websites with that and just share that. Uh, I, I think the only complicated part might, you know, I, I, if you can walk us through, um, I'm going to use mine to get me in, but I've got three other people coming with me. And I heard you say you can do it. Is, is, 
do you yes. put in it, that you want four tickets or you do yep, yours separately yep, you put, and you then put, the other you three? You would put four tickets okay. in there. And uh, I believe GoFan could help us where we can do screenshots um, and, and uh, walk it through, whether it's just myself or whether it's a tutorial. A bunch, you know, two student tickets, one adult ticket, and then the employee ticket. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll walk through that with it. And so they just designate which is which. Okay. Thank you. Yo, you're welcome. Let me. I, I do. Well, I want to let, let her make a comment, which may. So when we met with the executive staff, we did talk about in the past, uh, the superintendent sent something out to all employees. And we've talked about that as soon as we get past this today and we're moving forward and we think we've got a good plan. And, and you, if you don't come up with anything that might change that, uh, then we're ready to send it out because the, the employees are asking and that's that yeah, coming right. from the superintendent's office we will have that but mr teeley's done a good job on and, and having those videos i think we need that extra so because that's a little overwhelming it's not the way we've been doing it for years so it will be very helpful to have uh some some videos and things that they can refer to mr fetzko well my question and i don't know that you have the answer it may go to hr or it might go to it where do you find your employee ID number? There, there's uh, two things, you know, with that. So our unique employee identification number, uh, I would request that. Is it Ellis? It's actually on, in Skyward under the employee access. They'll be able to see their employee ID number. All right. So they have to look that up and remember it before they go. They will, hopefully once they get it once or twice they'll have it saved in their phone <laughs> yeah and and i i'll ask gofan that that question i believe when you buy your first ticket using gofan you've established your account because your cell phone number will be recorded your name will be recorded and that's that's contained for with them in their phone and so the student id number or the employee id number i be, okay. believe would be mr teeley has done a really good job working through this when we first met we talked about using our actual badges um, but we don't always collect each time someone leaves our employment their badge the badge is deactivated but they physically still have their badge and having spent some time coaching and working on our schools the monies that those in, those sports are able to collect are vital, and we wanted to be sure, certain that they got the money that they deserve. Yep. We I, have I, over 5,000 employees, so I would be responsible as a liaison between the district, GoFan, to upload those numbers. I was planning on doing it quarterly uh, so that the employees that fall off would come off, the employees that are added would be added. Um, I think uh, if somebody would have a, a, an issue, they could speak directly to the high school principal or athletic director uh, to get their issue resolved, or they could come to me uh, in the meantime to get it resolved. Otherwise, up every quarter, I would upload the 5,000 active employees. Anything else? Yes. I'm, I'm going <clears> to <throat> check yes, sir. The booster clubs with concession stands, they're still doing cash? Or is this just at the gate, right? Yeah, this is just tickets. Just tickets? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we are talking with the athletic directors, you know, with like concession stands and parking. Now, previously, the, uh, the superintendent said uh, we didn't want to, if we're collecting parking for like a football game or something, right. didn't want to go. GoFan could add that uh, onto the ticket. But don't previously, don't... they said, no, we didn't want to do that. You know, you know we right. could have a discussion with that. We've talked with the, the uh, concession stands that they can get that square and go uh, digital there or go ticketless, you know, there. But there may be some expenses on that, so we're still working on that. As a former president of the quarterback club for about seven years, uh, I would think it would be difficult out in that parking lot with all those cars coming in that parking lot because we do a good job trying to shut down the road anyway. Mm -hmm. So it had to be a very quick process for that to work. Yeah, I mean, ju just uh, uh, you got four people lined up. Five, if maybe you show to, you've got a you've yeah. got a ticket, yeah, it could go pretty quick with the go fan. It really could. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to go back into the procedure to make sure we get questions on this. You, you mentioned I'm buying the ticket at the gate. Are we still be able to do the ticket buying in advance? Yes. So it's always yeah. on the phone. That part was you, you wonderful. Could, we, we could be here. 
and say, you know what, I want to buy two tickets to Washington High School's basketball game. I can go to I can go to GoFan account, plug in Washington High School Pensacola, and then I'll see all their athletic events in there. Then click on the basketball you know that I want to attend. I can buy the two tickets right here. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can go to right to our school high or high school's websites. Uh, go to the athletic website. Most of them have the uh, scanner right on the page. You can take your phone and and with the uh, camera, and uh, the, you've got a square in there, and it pops right up for you. Right. Several different ways you can do it. Yeah, I I, I frequented a lot of events, but I, especially because I had a great nephew that was playing uh, baseball, and my wife and I attended. And I have to say that that system was fabulous. Just to walk up, pull it up on her phone or my phone. They scanned it, you walked in, and I, I did appreciate as a former principal, and I see a couple of shaking, shaking heads and a coach I know out back there thinking about it. You know, the, <clears throat> the, the money amount sometimes does get to be rather tremendous. And so this is, this is a great way to reduce that. <clears throat> Are we also reducing that necessity to sign in, you know, as, as, um, as employees, when we use the badge, we had to sign in on a sheet. We should have signed in on a sheet. This would not, no longer be necessary. No longer necessary. Correct. You know, and I... I would 100% agree with Keith, um, trying to word this very cautiously, um, multiple entrances under a badge cost schools money. Yes, sir. And this eliminates it. I think it does. And I think that that's, our employees have to know this. This badge is worth one ticket to one event at a time, and that's fair. And not, yes, I'm here and my entourage is with me. No, this is worth one ticket, and that's, that's good, and that's good for our em employees, but let's be fair to the kids and the coaches and the, the schools. And so um, I, I think that's an outstanding idea. It also eliminates, does this eliminate selling tickets at school? Uh, you, you, I mean, you can buy them in advance. So, you know, so if you wanted a ticket, as long, uh, I think some of the schools have already put up their football tickets for August, September, October, November. You could buy them right now from your seat in this room. I'm just, what I'm going back, I'm just going back to my old days. And come on, I got, and I'm looking at two principals. We used to sell tickets in the cafeteria, right? We're not doing that anymore. Not necessary. Not necessary. Yeah, <laughs> we got you're right. Former principal down here just beaming. <laughs> oh, I, I I think it's fabulous because I I know that you know we kids would come up with ticket money and you'd say, well, where's the ticket seller? And you'd have to go find who had the box and pay for them. Right, mm -hmm. and everything, and so. Um, yeah, this is a, a new a new world, a new era. Yes, is that a question? Or you? I, I do have one more question. Okay. Um, because this came up last year about GoFan. Are we going to have a district contract with GoFan, or is it still going to be individual schools' contracts? Um, I have not negotiated the contract, so I'm going from memory. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, specifically each school, there, there's a sign-up sheet, like I'm gonna do the middle schools. Middle okay. schools are gonna go ticketless, okay. so I'm using this as an example. Okay. So the principal will receive an electronic form that will plug in the principal's name, address, phone numbers, contact information, bookkeeper. The bookkeeper then, to turn this into a true cashless situation will be a direct deposit. We will have the banking information. That person will fill out uh, that information. So it's it's negotiated through the school district, through me, uh, in consultation with the executive committee. It's executed school by school basis. Wherever those monies were were intended to go to, they will um, enter the banking information where the monies go. Does that answer your M question? May I have a follow follow up? Yes. All right, what I'm asking is, um, 
I guess specifically, nobody can opt out, right? Because that, that was why I was asking if we as a district are, are, are gonna do this as a district-wide opportunity. Um, last year or the year before, before COVID, whatever, um, I, I got a, an email from somebody who wondered you know, where the district contract was approved. And I said, it, I went to Ms. Morgan, she said, no, each school had their own connection. So I just wanted to get that clarified. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And uh, I, I guess uh, in my inexperience with the job, I would tread lightly with that question. Maybe Ms. Mr. Morgan Smith. will take care of it. We're, yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't thought about it since, since we talked about it, but we will look into that and see if there's a benefit. But as it, when I answered it a year ago, it was, you know, each school and that worked. But we'll, it may be that we do, because it's not an opt-in, opt-out. The entire district, all or none. So, so does that mean that a motion will come before the board? Good. He's going to research just, it. I need yeah. to okay. research. Right now, we're okay. moving forward with this next year, and if we need one, we'll get with the purchasing and see what we need and what, what kind of contract, if it's through purchasing or whatever. I just need that. It, it just never started as, as it was individually, just right. because that's the way they're set up. But I'm sure we can look at that and see if there's a benefit. We just, I'm not uh, an expert on contracts, of course, but we can certainly get it. Dr. Adler, I'm not, I'm not ignoring you. I'm, right? I'm just concerned about if it's not a district wide contract. Right. Sometimes parents might put pressure on individual coaches. Well, we need to get out of this. Oh, and, and we were at that's the right. executive staff prior to this administration. We That's where it started. You know, these were at home campus and go fan and all that. So uh, a little different because we, we just knew this was going to move us forward and this is the right way to do it. It was the best way to do it. But uh, at that time, it didn't require contracts. So we'll or just, like I said, individual schools. But we do need to look at that, of course, as we are all in this, see if the, what the benefit is and and uh, and the attorney will of course advise us and okay. I'm not sure sometimes it ends up in purchasing sometimes it's in, and uh, but it all goes through the attorney so we'll as you know well know so we'll we'll take a look at that I just haven't thought about that since then but I appreciate you reminding us of that so Thanks. we'll do that quickly okay. and let you know Dr. Edler I have two questions and you may have already answered them uh, so they may be just for clarification you mentioned that Tickets can be bought in advance. Okay. Are they mailed to the individual or is, okay, so how far great, in advance? Great question. A great question. I'll illustrate it this way. So let's say that you're sitting there and you want to buy a uh, Booker T. Washington for football tickets, okay? Uh, two for your children that are out of state that are coming back for that game and one for you and a friend to go with the four of them. You will either get the tickets in a text message or you can get the tickets in an email. Okay, so we're, again, we're going digital with this, so you'll have that. As soon as you get those tickets, you can email or you can send the tech, you can forward the text link to your uh, two children that live out of state and they'll have them on their cell phone, you know, right there. If you're coming in at one end of the stadium and you've bought four tickets and again, you've got two friends, then, but they're at the other end of the stadium because of parking, you can send it directly to their phone in a text message. You can send it to an email, they will instantly have that. My second question, if I came to the game, I'm going to say basketball, I'm probably not going to come to football, okay? Or now. They promised <coughs> to teach me about it, and I promised I didn't want to learn about it. <laughs> so if, if I came, I had three other people with me. Yep. I'm eligible to get in free. The other three people how will they pay i know you're having some problem with managing cash so will they how will they pay at that door if, when one they, of one of the people each one of them can buy their own tickets individually or one person could buy the three or because you're getting your yours complimentary you could go to your cell phone scan the code or find the game on gofan okay click on the basketball game at, at washington high school i want four tickets enter your ID number for your ticket, which now is complimentary. And if you have one child, you'll have a, an elementary school, you got one high school kid, you'll have one student, and then you have one adult, you know, so they'll be at different prices right on there. And so you can have a free one, a one for $1, one for $3, one adult for $5, and show the four tickets uh, to the ticket taker, done, it's in seconds. But you don't use cash, it's an electronic transfer from your bank. Is there a charge for the tickets? There's a $1 charge uh, for the ticket. I don't want to pay that $1. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So how do those other three people pay? The, that, that dollar will be paid, have to be paid to use the GoFans. By me? Yes, whoever buys them. Yep, one dollar per handling ticket. Fee. You're talking about the dollar handling fee? Correct. Whatever it costs to get into the game. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a fee to get in the game, which is five. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adults. Using basketball, softball, baseball, right. football, seven. Five dollars for getting into the game. Yes. Then there's a one dollar fee that goes to the company. Yep. All of that is to handle through an electronic transfer. charge transfer, transfer yep. to your credit card or bank card, whatever you have on file. Credit, Am I yep, saying it correctly? Yep. That's partially the answer to my question, that it is you pay with the bank card. Correct. Okay, yep. but those three individuals can be responsible for their own ticket. Yes. All right. Oh, yes, sir. We're going to hold pins up now. That will. No. Does that work? But it, either that I get prefer it. fireworks. Yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I would also like to see that contract of this district wide coming for the board just to look. And also for the attorney, the insurer, she reviews it to ensure that if we do not allow somebody access in one of our games, there's no nothing legally, you know, that can, you know, blocking somebody coming to the game just because they got cash. You know, and I imagine in this day and time, everybody should have a debit card and credit card. My feelings, but I don't know on the legal side. So any contract that's district wide, I definitely want to get, see the attorney or re review that language. And uh, I would also like to look at details of the contract so I can determine whether it's such a great deal. Sounds like a great deal, but I'd like to see it. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'm leaving here with basically two action items that you're asking me for. One, uh, to get a copy of the contract uh, or how this is negotiated. Yeah. And then two, asking the question legally, if someone says, I'm not going to use my credit card, debit card, I'm going to only use cash, what's our response to right. that? Can we deny entry? And I Whether they're disabled can. or whatever. Yes, yes. sir. Many, many districts throughout the state are using this, so this is not just Escambia County, and it's a choice. If you want to go to the game, then this is how you get there, and and you have to use our ticketing. So I don't, I, I'm not the you're, legal. You're not person the legal either. lawyer. No, I know, but I'm just saying <laughs> yeah, so. it, it's proven. So I don't. I mean, we'll let her review it, but I can't see. It's a choice. We're not. It's we're not keeping anyone. I mean. It, I, here's what you have to do to get in our game I, this is I, the way you get there so it seems pretty sounds, simple sounds right? great it I is just, good I don't want to just want that board right. attorney to take a look and, 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 and we've like discussed that turn. dollar fee and is it worth it and all that but in the end it is I mean it, it does cost because the company's managing yeah, that user. but the end yeah right the end user so I, I but and and I do we do need to look at the contract obviously it passed the test the first time but let's see now that we're all um, at the table and moving forward as a district and and we do need to do it as a district I totally agree with that but I just I, it's a choice you know so if you don't like well, the way our ticketing is then you or can't do it then you you know that's and I, I want everyone because it's a community thing I'm not saying that but it is good for the school and again as Mr. Teeley said we're we're collecting enough money it is those games are expensive and some schools lose money as you well know as a booster and and all of our expenses are up yeah. uh, ambulance Officials, officials you name it because security it, we are it is costing a lot of money to, to to break even so we need help so right when i have to pay for all my grandkids and my husband right. i know i'm doing it for the kids and so yeah. that's what you have to remember this is this this is not just us making money we're not making a lot of money it's going back into the program to support those students right. so but we'll get that quickly and, and have that reviewed because we are moving forward with that. We're right around the corner with football. Right. Uh, like in just a few weeks. Full stadiums. Yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you. I will. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I will say I did witness a kid walk up with cash this, this past year. And what he did was he gave the cash to another kid and the ki other kid bought the ticket, okay. and that wasn't a problem. Yeah. Walked in, so that's there, there's easy ways to do it, and that actually came from the suggestion of the ticket taker. Yeah, just pay him, and he can buy it on his phone, and then no problem. 
Mr. Chair, that actually makes me feel a little better yeah. because one of my concerns was those kids that are living in generational poverty, do they have the same access to get to school? So, well, to again, this one so was that, just happened that to that be he didn't bring. better if somebody could swap cash with them to at least yeah. get them in the game. He had money in his pocket. He just didn't bring his wallet or his phone. He didn't have his phone on him. Right. And that's the, the that's the secret of buying it. Debit so. card or credit card. Most people don't carry cash anymore anyway. Yeah. Um, one question I did have, just really quickly, I'm sorry. Is it $1 per transaction or $1 per ticket? Per ticket. Okay. Per ticket, yes. Yeah. Thank you. That was from last year. It'll continue. Every baseball game I went to, I paid $6. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and thanks for all Welcome. the work that y'all have been doing on this. Um, I think this could be very beneficial. And we may have some b bumps this year. Anytime you do something different, <clears throat> then it becomes the routine. And so that's good. All right. Let's see. Where were we? Matt was beside Tower. Portable. Portable classrooms. Mr. Adams wants a portable classroom. No, no, no. <laughs> I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Uh, I saw a newspaper article, and uh, actually I thought it was fabulous, and uh, it talked about a strategic plan to remove portables, uh, classrooms, all for it. Great. I just wanted to know a little bit more of the details because I got, like, two situations, and I think I saw an agenda for Tuesday night, and forgive me, I've been out of town till last night. Oh, you had an answer to it? No? Okay. I saw that Beulah Elementary was on the uh, agenda for portables to be removed, right? And then we had the, on the flip side, we got Pine Forest, which has a good size of its population in portables. Okay. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more if y'all, how y'all are going to tackle the, the elimination of portable classrooms, which I'm all for. The five-year plan, 10-year plan, or what are we on? Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Um, as you see on your agenda, there are actually five portables this summer uh, for demolition. We actually have another five, so we'll eliminate 10 this summer. Right now, we have 236 portables throughout the district. Sounds like a lot, but by comparison, Clay County has 900. So we're doing fairly well. As you may recall, some of you that have been on the board a while or been with us for a while, we were very close to getting to zero at one time uh, until class size reduction came into play, in which case we had, to, we had to rapidly expand our capacity. It is our intent to systematically, as you alluded to, get rid of the individual mo or portable classrooms. So we're not talking about modulars. Modulars are considered permanent capacity and have a, have a longer shelf life. Uh, but right now we have 10 this summer. We'll continue to demolish them as we can each time we build additional capacity, like you mentioned at Beulah Elementary. Our target is also to replace all relocatable capacity with permanent capacity over time. It's impossible to forecast how long it's going to take to get through 236 uh, because each year our enrollment ebbs and flows as well. And we have, there needs to be some portable capacity just for. Um, to be nimble and be able to move as necessary, but for the most part, we're gonna try and get rid of all of them. Uh, I'd like to see that happen in my career, which is another, hopefully another 10 years, but it's gonna take some time. All right, thanks, sir. That answer? Yeah, yeah. I'm May all for I it. ask a question, sir? You sure can. Uh, when you say 236 portables, are those in use as classrooms? Good question, ma'am. Actually, no, not all of them are in use as classrooms. There's probably, this is a guesstimate, but I'd say probably 25% of those are used for ancillary purposes such as storage, PTA, resource, et cetera, that actually don't carry student stations. Thank you. So we're far better than most, actually. Follow up. Okay. Well, let me let me make sure, Mr. Fesco, you have it, Dr. Edler, do you have any questions? Go right ahead. So I think, you know, one of my concerns is that Beulah Elementary, once we upsize the facility, I still have that portable farm over there, okay? We don't need to go back with students back in that portable farm. We, we need to use other methods. So that's my, we got that empty portable farm. How long do you think for that can be removed? As you're aware, when we add the cafeteria renovations, the former spaces that the, caf the current cafeteria is, which is inside the core of the building, is planned to be converted into classroom spaces. Obviously, every time we add a portable or a permanent unit, we can 
remove. Uh, it'll be a while before Beulah's without portables because you're, you're looking at not only the cafeteria renovation and the retrofitting in the existing space, but eventually another permanent capacity addition, such as a 10 classroom addition. We have done some things to be economical. We have a standard 10 classroom addition prototype, which allows us to move through construction very quickly. Um, you've been to Workman Middle School. We did that a few years ago. That helps. There are plans for that at Pine Forest and other places where we have large numbers. We are acutely aware of our schools that have high numbers, Pine Forest being the highest and Beulah being, I believe, second or third behind that, and we're working through those in a priority. So as we remove them, it is our intent to remove them at the highest volume. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions on portables? I do want to make one thing clear. Some portables aren't being used for classrooms, but are you being used for other student activities? Our intent is we we can't. I don't think with the asset sales tax we can take a portable out and put put in a dressing facility for the softball team. That's not the intent, right? We intend to continue to use that facility as a dressing facility. That portable. That's. An, Again, we always defer to the needs of the schools. If the schools or the principals or the administrators on site say we need this unit to remain for this purpose and it's not carrying a student station and thereby counting against <coughs> us for capacity, then by all means we're going to accommodate those requests. I want to make sure that's clear because there, there are a lot of them that we have requested and been moved and are in good use and parents take care of them. And they're very proud of them, and <laughs> they paint them, and they do everything. So I, I do appreciate that. So that's good. Anything else on portables? Superintendent, any comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to add, too, it's, it's, I think, worth noting that movement of a portable is extremely expensive. Ooh. So to, to have one come in or one go out. So... That impacts a decision sometimes. If uh, if enrollment goes up and that portable is used one year, it goes down the next year and you have an empty portable, it can be cost effective to kind of stay the course with that if, if it's in and out, mm -hmm. you know, of utilization just because of those install and those removal costs are so, so very high. So that's part of that nimble factor that, Mr. Dennis referred to. And I think currently we prefer to demolish instead of move someplace else. Is that, am I right? Yes, sir. That's right. I don't think some of them can be moved. Well, <laughs> <laughs> me and Superintendent yeah. That's one reason we don't pay We don't pay them to move it. It's, yeah. If it's falling down, it's <laughs> not going to be moved. It's going to be removed. Well used. <laughs> yes. Anything else? We're good? All right, thank you. Uh, Interlocal agreement, infrastructure, and growth. Yeah, I was almost going to title this as unfinished business for the for the board because I have two items that the board fully approved. One was the changes to ILA and the uh, uh, land development code changes that we requested. The other one was the letter we sent requesting 25 acres on site eight. But I'll start with the first one was the ILA. Um, I, I had several phone calls. Yes. Or for the record, explain what that is. Uh, the interlocal agreement between Scammon County and the school board. Thank you. Uh, what we have proposed is the board to tighten up the concurrency requirements within two miles for the safety of our students in regards to sidewalks, crosswalks, and any other issues like that, infrastructure improvements. Because as you know, we, we've got a shortage of bus drivers, so that would help us get those kids that can walk easily within a half mile or so to the schools, connect those sidewalks to nowhere that are literally with inside of the school that we've seen, okay, to get them kids off the busy roads. But uh, so anyway, I had several conversations with Commissioner Bagosh. He was a little confused on this, where this was, because I hadn't came to him yet, and uh, got with uh, Mr. Dennis. And you sent an email, right, to uh, to your counterpart. Do you want to see? tell us where we're at on this? Yes, sir, and just for the record and to refresh everyone's memory, um, we had a discussion with the board about edits to the ILA, as Mr. Adams mentioned. Uh, those edits were presented. We actually convened the uh, Joint Planning Committee, which is articulated in the ILA, on May 18th. 
and all those edits were presented in hard copy to uh, the county staff that are a part of that team. Um, I would characterize the meeting as very positive and the edits were, were reviewed one by one by the committee and I didn't see or read any adverse reaction on the part of the county. Uh, it's my understanding after I reached out to uh, my counterpart at the county earlier this week that that is now being moved forward. I believe there was some delays. There was some administrative changes, as you're well aware of, at the county, and a <laughs> lot of things got slowed down. Uh, that is back on track for their, so they are currently reviewing your proposed changes. That's where we stand right now, sir. Yes. So um, Commissioner Bragosh has pledged support to get this passed. I think it's very important for the school district and its community. So. Uh, I may have to have a little unfinished business category on the workshop so we can go back because, as you know, some things get lost lost over time because we're busy, our staff's busy, their staff is busy. So uh, I would tell you there's three more subdivisions going in on Mobile Highway by Buell Elementary. There's a huge one going in behind my house and that hunting land behind my house is going in. I can't keep track of the subdivisions that are being improved anymore. Every time you turn around, you just see a bulldozer start clearing and more are going in. So this, this ILA, this interlocal agreement is going to be very important for us as we try to attempt to get our kids in a safe way to the school with the crisis we have with the bus drivers. Uh, Mr. Dennis, do you have a follow-up? Are you done? Okay. No, sir. Uh, the, second, the second item is the letter we sent requesting the 25 acres. As you know, uh, the superintendent and I visited Chairman Bender and... Uh, Commissioner Pagash, who's the District 1 Commissioner. To this date, I still do not know whether that request that this board sent has been approved for the 25 acres, okay? We, to this date, we have still not even had discussions on what, which piece of land on the site confirmed. Anyway, confirmed, there's been discussions of where that land be, to even see if this board will accept what's being proposed from the county. And as I told uh, Commissioner Bagosh, this, this school is for the county commission, really, to continue building them subdivisions. Because if they build another 60 in the next five years, like they did the last five years, we got a huge problem. Okay, so I just wanted to get this back out there in the sunshine again that, and let my constituents know, right now there's, you know, till we know exactly where the land is, was it acceptable, whether it'll work, there's no school going in on site eight right now till we, we get a follow-up with, uh, with the county. So I'm hoping, Superintendent, that you can direct staff to, I don't know if it'd be Mr. Dennis or who, to contact his counterpart to see where that letter is, to see if the commissioners will decide where that land be located. I see uh, Ms. Hightower. I think I know what Ms. Hightower is fixing to go ahead and say, but go ahead, Ms. Hightower. Well, I just wanted to let you know that in the plan that was not passed at the last county commission meeting, there is school on the on the plans. There is a school. And in, in every plan that the uh, TB, DPC has put forth, there is land for a school. Um, and so... I, I might suggest to this board that we try to have a joint meeting with the county commission because ultimately it's in their right. their laps right now. Yeah. And um, were they, I their parliamentarian, I'd be concerned that at that meeting they tabled the plan with no date certain to bring it back. And in my parliamentary knowledge, when you table something with nothing stated as the time certain to bring it back it's dead so um you know if 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 they're not moving forward with the plan yes um Backwards. there yeah we we i think we need to sit down i know i've talked to commissioners as well i don't see them as is is saying no so i don't know whether they're waiting for a plan to be adopted before they respond to us or whether we, if we had a joint meeting with the county commission, we could get them to say whatever, I mean, I have heard them say whatever is, whatever we finally decide to do on that piece of land, we will provide space for a school. Right. Um, 
but you know it, maybe we do a joint me meeting with them after budgeting is over because uh, everybody's in this and they have had a lot of turnover there um it just just to sit down with them and and have them you explain as you have explained so well to us you know where we are why we're going forward with this it has not come to the planning board for comment the um there is a process that it goes through uh, and i imagine those those amendments will come through to the planning board yeah. i just haven't seen them on there yet and, and just a follow up to that mr chair sure. Uh, the problem that we had with the original plan by ADP, ADP, DPC is what they envisioned was a school just for Site 8. So they gave this little yellow dot over into the woods by the beaver pond. Okay, that was my airfield, so I know exactly. And that's one of the things we explained to Chairman Bender. Uh, for a school that's going to have 1,200, 1,400 kids, there is no way we, had, we showed them in the office that it could even go at the location or whether it even would work that won't that won't work what i'm concerned is is now they're asking for more commercial land on site eight that school really needs to be in that northwest corner over there that we get this decided because once stuff gets built or they they sell off to other commercial it's too late so that's why i'm hoping to push this a little bit if we can but i agree with the joint meeting i think that'd be a good idea I can appreciate the energies that is spent <clears throat> talking about the needs of children in North Escambia County. I am so disappointed that that level of energy is never spent discussing the needs of children South Escambia County. It's, the South is building growing there are going to be need for those children but i hear no discussion when i listen to the news i see where they're building a new subdivision hogshock where people used to live a long time ago i see where where the old school board building apartments are coming up there when i travel through the neighborhoods property that African Americans used to own long time ago is being built houses, low income, whatever, affordable houses. I don't know who they're affordable for. But the city is moving further out eventually. So what I am requesting today, that as much energy is spent on the needs of children in the North that this board began to address the needs of the children in the South. Anything else? I'll, I'll address something on that. No, I, I think that there needs to be discussion, and there has been, and there will continue to be, discussion about student enrollment, st where students live, where they reside, what needs are, where they're is excess capacity in schools and where there are schools that are over capacity. I think that one of the things that repeatedly uh, Mr. Adams has brought up is that Buell Elementary is over capacity based upon the number of portable buildings there. I don't want to get into looking at we need to look at the school district. We need to look at the south, the north, east, west, everything as a whole. Where is our population moving? Where are the needs? And what do we already have in place that's underutilized that we might may, may, may need to make some changes or differences based upon the actual students who live in a section? In, in my understanding, most of our facilities at this point are within the capacity limits. We have a few that are over. The majority, we still have room for a little bit, but we're not crowded. On the west side, our capacities are where they need to be. I don't see that we're over at many. I think we're up a little bit at, at Cairo. We're up a little bit at Blue Angel. The new Myrtle Grove, our new Pleasant Grove Elementary will alleviate all that. Um, when we get to a little bit further east, 
We still have some capacity at Navy Point, at Warrington Elementary. Um, West Pensacola is up some, so they should be holding their own. Um, I don't know that we're, we're not over capacity at Global. We're not over capacity at um, Weiss, not over capacity at Sims, not over capacity at Souter or at, at uh, Cordova Park. So I, I don't know where we're not addressing needs, where as capacity goes. And, and whether we looked at, uh, if we're looking just regionally rather than globally of what are the needs of the district, I think we're gonna, we're gonna paint ourselves into some corners that we don't need to be in. Yes. Go ahead, yes, go ahead. I tend to agree with what you're saying, but I don't believe that you're agreeing with what I'm saying. When you look at Beulah, when we're talking about Beulah, and I, 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 don't, I don't have a problem with where we're placing children. What I have a problem with is where we are spending all of our energies in one area and not an, an, another area. When we look at Beulah, you all are looking at projections that this area is growing and there's going to be a need. That same energy is not south in the, in the community. I don't hear anybody saying, well, when we build the Hawk Chuck apartment over there, that's supposed to be like 1,500 people. And when we build the, the one where the school board used to be, that's going to be X number of people. I don't hear projections of how we are going to address the needs of the children living in these areas to compare with the amount of time that is spent on the needs of the children at Beulah. I love those children at Beulah just as much as I love the children anywhere, but I want fairness in this community when we begin to look at projects, look at needs, and I don't hear that. Now, if you're saying it, maybe at a time, remind me when you're saying it. I want to address that uh, statement on, on that. The situation here is different than any other situation we've ever dealt with in looking for, looking at the needs of areas. The, what is that piece of property called? OL8, what is it? OLF8. 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 Outline field. The problem is, it isn't ours. And if we don't expend some energy to make sure that they include us, then we will regret that down the road. There's not a brick being put in a, a, a concrete block or a piece of concrete or anything being put in the ground on this property. The energy right now is being spent to make sure that they remember the promise that was made by several of their commissioners that property would be placed, given to the school district for potential growth. We may never use it. I just, I, let's just be honest. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly what the populations are gonna look like. Now, I will be looking forward to seeing from Mr. Marcanio and others, what's our enrollment? Right now, we're down 2,000 students. 2,000 students does not warrant new construction, but we can't ignore what the county is doing if they're sitting out there on 600 acres. One mile, five, one mile square land. They, we can't ignore the possibility of their sitting on property and there's a the potential of us getting some of that for the future. Yeah. Way down the road for the future could be. I don't know that there will be a member on this board still around when that is brought to the board by the superintendent to say we need to look at construction. But we can't ignore it. Now, if you can find something like that going on in the south part, I'll, 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 I'll be glad to ask the superintendent and, the, uh, and the, Mr. Dennis to expend the same amount of energy to try to figure out where we can get some, some basically 
some free property. If the city's got something they want to give us, fine, we'll take it too. But we're, we're, we're in, the, in a position that we cannot let them not re think about us when they're developing the plan for this piece of property. I had a call from a county commissioner, and he needed something from the school district. I'm not sure if he's called Mr. Dennis or not. And he's, he needs it because of not building something. He needs it because of water, holding pond. I reminded him that don't forget about us. We have some needs too. So if we're going to be fair with you, you be fair with us. He's committed. He's told me that, oh, don't worry. I'm not going to forget it. But, you know, that uh, we, we can't ignore those things. So if you can find a piece of property, that the city wants to give us, or we we ought to be act, uh, 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 going after. Let us know where it is. I think Mr. Watson would be glad to go out and figure out what's going on on that piece of property. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, what I'm thinking about at this moment in this discussion, like Dr. Edler said, there are there is construction and there are communities smaller, but still communities and and construction occurring in the south end also. But I thought that the interlocal agreement had some concurrency kind of thing or something. And, and if we focus on that, any of the construction that's happening, regardless of where it is in the county, that the county has some responsibility or the developer has a responsibility to set aside property for those purposes. So as we see, uh, projects that go on in Hawkshaw or wherever, there needs to be the reminders, I guess, to the city government and or county government that you better put aside some some property for Fine. educating these students, regardless of what part of the county it's in. And, and that's why this interlocal agreement is going to be so important for us to get it, but for people to abide by that interlocal agreement. Mr. Chair. Let me miss hot tower go. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment to Dr. Edler. I, I have been noticing a lot of the infill, a lot of growth, and I had had a conversation with Mr. Dennis um, to make sure he was keeping up with what, the number of students that might be coming into that area because you know we we do have to and and there there are other remedies that we can do besides building something that right. i won't talk about um but but you know we do have to continually look at our whole county we have to know where the students are um there is a formula somewhere that helps you generate a, an, a, an approximate number if if a house is built here and how many subdivision how many kids might be expected to be in that and so i know that um mr dennis has if you've ever gone to a school attendance zone committee meeting it is amazing the amount of information that we have about the number of students in any one subdivision um and and so i want i have not talked about it here but I have talked with Mr. Dennis about keeping us surprised of, you know, when he sees that there's going to be an influx of students into a particular area. I want to make it very clear that it is not my responsibility to go around looking for land. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to the children of Escambia County, I believe that each of us have a responsibility. And I believe that you all are missing my point. I'm not talking about your interlocal agreement. I'm talking about the needs of children in Escambia County. And that over and over we talk about the needs of the children in Beulah. But I don't believe that I have heard that same conversation for the children south. A lot of the problems I believe that have happened with our children is when the community schools were removed from the communities and children were shuffled away out in other schools and limited to no consideration for schools closer to home. The only point of my conversation is 
the energies that is spent discussing the needs of children north of Scambia County need to be the same level of discussion south of Scambia County. I will not waver from that. I appreciate the work that you all are doing. And you all need to appreciate that I'm going to speak out and openly as much as I please about the needs of the children all over this district. And so when you talk about what is needed in Beulah, I need to know what is needed in Cordova, in Englandwood, in Shantytown, in Bell's Head. There are children living everywhere and some point we need to bring discussions to this table about the needs of all children in Escambia County. Mr. Fetzko, your uh, item on update on Pleasant Grove. All right, moving right along. Moving right along. I had, uh, I've had some communication from um, people who were directly involved. Primarily, there, there were some uh, representatives from the Naval Air Station who contacted me about the possibility of a tour of, of that property and, and to look at the uh, progress of the construction for the new Pleasant Grove. Con I talked to uh, Mr. Dennis and he said that it was not safe at that time for anyone to do the tour because a lot of uh, heavy metal and iron was being uh, constructed and it would not be. But I asked him then if he would just do an update of where we are with the new Pleasant Grove Elementary so that any of those people who may be watching will know where we are and when they could expect to uh, possibly take a, a, a walk through. Right, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again on this one. Um, probably the most precarious time in the construction of, of a large facility like a school is when the top steel is going on. Those are major uh, steel beams and whatnot that are being hoisted up and put into position. That's actually what's happening right now. The good news is they'll, uh, when the last or when the primary beam goes on the very top of the roof, it's a, it's a, it's a point in construction called topping out. And actually the, con the contractors generally stop and celebrate that. And sometimes we're able to participate in that as well as the owners. We will be topping out Pleasant Grove Elementary within the next couple of weeks. They're in the process of drying in the facility. We absolutely welcome our community to come see what's going on out there because it's a marvelous facility. But it's hard to envision what it is when it's not dried in and the roof's not on it. You can say, well, over here in this corner that kind of looks like a room is going to be this, that, and the other. We're very close to getting to a point, drying in the building and topping it out to where a tour would be uh, infinitely more practical. Uh, I will tell you that our general contractor on site who owns the site right now, that's the, the way it works with construction. They have control over the site. They have to for their own liability's sake, Wharton Smith welcomes the opportunity to showcase what we're doing out there. Just to give you an update on the progress, we are scheduled still to open for school year 23-24. That's always been the case. This is probably the most protracted and lengthy construction timeline we've ever had. Reason for that is a very challenging permitting process associated with the wetlands, Army Corps of Engineers, water, regional water management, the state, the county, and DOT. Uh, I am very happy to tell you that we are well ahead of schedule. So much so that there is a remote possibility that we will have substantial completion in the fall of 2022. That's about a half a year ahead of schedule, half a school year ahead of schedule. There's a remote possibility, as we did with Ernest Ward, as we did with A.K. Souter, of possibly doing a mid-year transition for at least the students that reside in the current Pleasant Grove School. The attendance zone committee, as uh, Ms. Hightower mentioned, will be convening the fall of this year. That will address the other two schools impacted. 100% of Pleasant Grove is, is expected to attend the new school and a fraction of Helen Caro and Blue Angels, as you mentioned, Mr. Fetzko, are also slated. The attendance zone committee will articulate that so that when we open fully on the intended timeline of school year 23, 24, will have all three school student populations moving into the school. But again, we're well ahead of schedule. We are not going to rush it. It is nice to have the ability, heaven forbid, in a hurricane season like we have here, we could, we could sustain a substantial delay due to hurricanes and still remain on time because of us being able to get through the permitting process quicker than anticipated. Uh, 
We're still working with DOT on the Sorrento access. We look to have that resolved soon, so you'll see an improvement to the uh, deceleration lane, and there's still talk of a light there to help assist in that process. Uh, topping out next week, and I think that's, that's pretty much what I can share with you right now. Um, knock on wood, ahead of schedule and under budget right now, subject to change at any minute. All right. Thank you. Bring us a picture. I've, I've driven out there and looked at it as far as just at the end, end of the roadway. We should, fabulous. Have, we should have aerials pretty soon. We have progressive aerials that are taken. Uh, we should have aerials. That's fabulous. Soon. Yes, ma'am. Well, that was what I was going to ask about because when Jim Bailey, I mean, not Jim Bailey, when Beulah Middle was being built, there were drone pictures that were, you know, up, uploaded so that the public could kind of see the progress. So we'll go ahead and get those out on our facilities yeah. website. And if when the last when the next round comes around, I'll see if I can get those emailed to all our board members as well. Thank you. The only thing I have to say is, having suffered through the opening of Kingsfield in the last minute, don't rush anything. Right. Take your time. But it's a fantastic facility. All right, Mr. Superintendent, you're up. And we're just going to do the substitute right now, and then we'll get into your comments after we take a break. Okay. So okay. we have Courtney Combs to come um, share about the substitute teacher pilot program. Provide up, Courtney. Welcome. Hello. Can you Hello. hear me? Get close. We can. Oh. <laughs> um, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to meet with you again to give you a report on the substitute pilot program. Uh, slides in this presentation will give you an overview of the results and provide you with information on our current strategies. Okay. So here um, on this slide, it shows the fill rates for the five schools who participated in the sub-pilot program. The last line um, across shows the district's rates as a whole during the last 12 weeks of the last school year. Um, as you can see, some of the schools increased while others not as much as we had hoped. Um, however, I'd like to highlight that as the year progressed, the district as a whole showed an increase. So as a result, we are planning to address the shortages district-wide. Um, um, one of the strategies is uh, this, an this is the anticipated pay rate increase for the substitute teachers based on their education level. Um, that will be presented to you for approval in August. We believe these rates will not only meet the upcoming increase across the state for minimum wage, but more importantly, because we believe that the increase will show our current substitutes that we value them and hopefully appeal to others in the community who may want to look into teaching as a career and need a place to begin or would just like to work with our schools part time. Um, we're already implementing these strategies currently for the school year, um, as you see them here. Um, thanks to your approval to use Chapter 2 to allow applicants who have a high school diploma to apply. Now we feel um, it, will, it will continue to help us um, at least to get to that 90 to 95 percent fill rate. Um, Thanks to Brian Alabac and Jennifer Kitchens over in Professional Learning, we now have a website specifically designed for uh, our substitute teachers that, provide, that will provide detailed information on requirements once they're hired and other information specific to substitute teachers' role in the schools. Um, the third point there is communication to schools. We want to communicate often to the schools um, about best practices to attract subs to their schools um, and increase their fill rates, which would include um, providing general information to the subs when they first come on campus, 
um, even tutorials to teachers on how to use the substitute management system to better entice the, the subs to take their, their classes. Um, and information, just general information to attract them to, the, to our schools. Um, the substitute focused training um, is continuing and um, we will continue with volunteer training regarding um, specific technology resources that we have now, um, Google Classroom and those types of things that they actually did use in this past uh, 2021 school year. And then um, the superintendent also said, suggested that we do virtual training on our professional development days. So we are gonna put that together for them. And even um, recognition, um, we want to send out a survey basically to all of the principals for all the schools to um, highlight their favorite subs and we could recognize one for the year. Um, the support a school project was actually something I talked to um, my counterpart over in Dugal County. And basically what they had been doing was um, they would take the employee volunteers, like the actual employees within the administrative buildings and other locations um, to sub in the schools, but in specific targeted schools in at specific uh, targeted times, like those times around all the holidays, right before we get out of school, testing, those types of times. Um, just or just in the last nine weeks of the school year, we would make sure that they had all the credentials that they needed to be in the classroom. And that would also alleviate some of uh, the fill rate issues as well. And give, give the employees a um, hands-on look into how substitutes are utilized and how they are, um, how much of an asset they are to our district. We've had a pretty good uh, summer hiring season for substitutes this year and expect that to continue all the way up until August. And we believe with the pay increase along with these current strategies we're implementing, we will see a significant increase in our fill rates for the 21-22 school year. Um, this actually concludes my presentation and I'd love to hear any questions that you have. Let me just start with Mr. Superintendent. Do you have any comments you want to make on this? Yeah, I, I want to, first of all, thank Courtney for her work on this and running this pilot. And I think what the pilot did reveal is we we did get a little bump in response, uh, m probably more so on a consistent level at the high school and the elementary level. Um, we, of course, had three middles. Could, really, we, we added the middles because they were struggling uh, getting substitutes, so we thought that might help um, but it, it it points towards bumping up the pay a, a little bit I think it, it gives us a little bit of foundation uh, pointing towards pay increase making making a difference and and thus the the proposed increases there um, that we we are looking at I also think um, some of the ideas that have been presented as far as supporting this the schools are are very important because we need to make sure our substitutes feel supported um, and that can be some that, that can be a, a a a tough thing to accomplish sometimes especially when you have substitutes moving around from school to school to school so anything we can do to really uh, support, uh, provide additional um, resource to them and um, let them know that they are extremely important to the functioning of our schools uh, is added benefit. Any comments, Ms. Hightower? I had a couple of questions. Um, what training do we give to teachers on how to prepare for a substitute? Well, usually it's um, within the the school, um, their administration. Usually it's within them. the school. Yeah. Are we sure that they get the training to know how to prepare for a substitute to come into their classroom? Oftentimes that's what I hear is the problem while they won't go back is because every time they have subbed there, they're, 
there's nothing for them to use, you know, and some other teacher has to come in and help them. So I just wondered if that might be something we need to address um, is making sure that all teachers know how to be ready their classroom. I, I realize that somebody gets up in the morning and they're sick, but um, they all have lesson plans and stuff, but maybe, leave, you know, a go bag or something. Actually, you, guys, actually, Ms. Actually, Ms. you go ahead, Courtney, and then I'll go, <laughs> young lady. Actually, that was that's part of the communications to the schools okay. is, um, I, um, actually, I was going to discuss it at the principal's that, meeting. That's what I was getting ready to tell. Um, on Monday that um, I would be able to come in and talk to their teachers, at least during pre the pre-planning time frame, give them an overview of the substitute management system and the information that they can put in there they can even they can put they can upload pretty much any document that they need the substitute to have i think that perhaps in the past we just haven't um, communicated as well as we should have so that's one of the things and those that's one of the things that um, i plan on speaking to the principals about and giving them examples of what they could have you know the information sheet that they can um, give out to the subs as soon as they show up um, examples of substitute plans that they can have their their uh, teachers mirror and maybe have the um, at least five days of emergency plans ready to go during that pre-planning period when they're already getting all of their um, materials together so that's thank part you of it. and if I could ask one more question do we have a way to survey a substitute teacher at the end of their work day to ask them whether that was a great experience or not so great and and what could we have done to improve your experience as a sub yes we do actually um the system itself uh i've i was able to go in at least this at the beginning of the 2019 school year or the 2020 20 21 school year uh, this year and adjust the um questions that are sent the frontline system or the substitute management system sends them a request to answer these specific questions within 14 days of them substituting. So they're getting them pretty frequently. And whenever I, I, we, we do a training for the substitutes, I always mention feedback because there's a feedback feature in there for the substitutes, but also for the teacher. Okay. And so the teacher is requested um, to send that feedback as well about, and it was specific questions about whether their room was clean when they left, um, did the substitute leave a report, um, whereas the substitutes, um, they have specific questions like how easily was it to get to your room, you know, was there any um, specific things that you couldn't find, that kind of thing. So we do have that feature. And, and, and is that feedback sent to the district level or do the principals at the school level get to see that? The principals at the school level can see that if they want. Um, they do have access to that. Um, mostly I review it just to see where I could uh, speak to the principals about certain things. Um, usually the substitutes are pretty good about um, given their feedback. And more often than not, we get um, information from the teachers as well. So it's a good way to, if we get a, an incident report from a school, it's good to go back and see all of the information about that day, not just what someone told the principal and the principal had to um, report to us in HR. Okay, Dr. Edler, anything? Thank you. What type of training do the subs have on discipline? On discipline? How to discipline the, the children, what the rules are. And well, um, I go into, they are always, if there's an incident in the classroom, they are always to request um, assistance from the office. Um, also, I tell them when they first get to the school that they need to uh, speak they need to know who their neighbors are across the hall right next to them and get the the um the phone numbers or the extensions to each one of those teachers 
because if a sub goes into one classroom, you know, maybe he or she doesn't understand uh, the dynamic of the classroom or um, who usually speaks up more than other students. And so they can immediately um, get the assistance from other uh, teachers in their area. Um, we also go over some specific um, actions that they can and cannot do, such as you don't touch kid. Um, I understand if there are students that run up to you, especially the little ones that like to run up to you and hug you, and that's fine if they know you, but you need to be aware of, uh, they need to be aware of um, their actions and they need to make sure that they are conducting themselves properly and um, if it looks like it be perceived in an inappropriate way then you don't do not need to do that and so those are the types of things we do as far as the um, discipline we always express to them that they need to contact the office or um, another teacher so that they aren't administering their own type of discipline that's not within the, the, <coughs> the framework of the school. Are they receiving any training on how to de-escalate a situation? Okay. Do they have training about cultural awareness and responsiveness? Yes. Um, we do. Well, I try to keep it more um, of an overview of the some schools um, have a different, uh, they do have a different culture. They do have a different um, socio socioeconomic uh, population. They have to be aware of um, those types of, um, you know, if a kid comes to school, they might be acting out because they're hungry or um, they didn't get any sleep. So they have to be very patient. So I, I try to, or we in HR, try to make sure that um, all of the training that we give could, can apply to all types of children, whether they're in whatever socioeconomic um, area they're in in Pensacola. Are you keeping any data on the number of incidents that occur with the sub versus with the regular teacher? Are you getting more referral or more incidents or less or about the same? Um, well, I normally um, only get the reports for substitutes, so I'm not sure. I, I, I don't see that data. Um, Maybe Mr. Leonard could um, say something about that. Courtney does a great job uh, handling all the substitute teacher incidents. Uh, if there was ever a situation where it was a, a discrepancy or a disagreement between the teacher and the substitute, we would communicate with each other. So far, that has not happened. I, I just think it would be good information when you're looking at evaluating your subs. Uh, to look at the, the number of incidents related to discipline. Uh, and in and, and my opinion, that would basically kind of tell me, you know, we need to get Ms. Jones back here to do sub, and because we don't have any problems with students, she knows how to relate or he knows how to relate to the student. I just believe that that's good information that may be helpful to. Okay. Thank you. Let's go. Yes, I, I, this really tied into what Ms. Hightower had asked earlier, and <clears throat> Courtney, I know that you do things from the district level when the subs first come into the system and you work with them there. I wondered if we might ask two of the people who've been principals, uh, pick on Ms. Farish and, and Ms. Morgan, to say what were their expectations to their teachers about having sub plans uh, and what do they tell the teachers at that level? And now that at the, dis at the uh, district level, they could have impact with what's going on as long as they're in touch with things. But if you wouldn't mind, ladies, giving us a, a, a brief overview of what do you tell your teachers in terms of having sub plans ready and working, and what did you do to help the subs who came into your school? And welcome. Thank you. 
So having just left Pleasant Grove last year and prior to that I was at OJ Sims, so I understand the subsystem in all various schools. But my expectation is that teachers have to have a set of sub plans. Um, it can be like a five day if the teacher knows they're going to be out. Uh, but there's all, always supposed to be the emergency set of lesson plans so that a sub's not going in a room and they're saying there's nothing here, I don't know what to do. But I also have strong grade levels no matter what school I've been in. And the teachers in that grade level are not going to let a sub fall apart. You know, if, if something is not right, they will make sure that there are um, assignments for that. They will, um, I check, I mean, I go around a classroom so I know if there's sub plans in there and it hasn't been that many times, but on occasion I've had to say something to a teacher, you know, you didn't have any sub plans in place. And uh, so ultimately it is, as the principal of the school, it's my responsibility to make sure that whatever's going on in my building is carried out very well and that we don't have situations like that. Thank you. And, and ditto what she said. The only thing I can add is that we also um, had, in case a teacher didn't, and sometimes they did not have what we needed, then we had a set of lesson plans that we could, at the, at the principal level, and, and, and our faculty leaders were excellent too. They step in, that is our, they save us. They step in and do what they need to do. But we also had lesson plans at the school level that you could you could quickly use just so that the teacher the substitute could could have order and students had something to do so it's a team effort uh and we tell them every and we 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 assist them and miss Payne could probably speak better to this too because i've been out of the school a while but she's recently out of the school i mean it's the expectation and we just bring the teams together and and we 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 have copies of their, we always, I always required copies of their lesson plan. And it's cer certainly easier now than even when I was in there because you can just put that in a Google Drive and there you go, you can quickly, because a lot of things happen in the morning and you have things that you don't know that's going to happen. So you're quickly trying to manage that. I mean, the first thing you're looking at is which classroom am I not gonna have a teacher in today, I'm gonna have a sub. And if it's a sub that's used to your school, it makes a difference too. And sometimes it is and sometimes it's not because you know you're, you need a sub, you'll take a sub no matter what. But um, those that are, are have been at a school and continue to go to the same school, then they know what to do. They walk in, walk in knowing what to do. But it's a, it's a constant effort. And, and again, I, I credit our teachers to, as Ms. Parrish said, stepping up and those faculty leaders and other teachers and, and their neighbors, as Courtney mentions, the neighbors, the other teachers, that they always look out for the sub. So it's a tough job now. That is a hard job, I will say that. And so did, we need to support them. Did you ever have an experience where the sub came back to you to say, hey, these are the things, you know, I, yes. like a post day I do. discussion with mm -hmm. the sub to well, say. And they will quickly tell you, um, They'll either tell you I'm not coming back no. <laughs> <laughs> or they will tell you I didn't I needed more resources. Right. I mean, and we appreciate that. And I think our principals do a better job now than ever. And we you know, we we have a lot of subs. I mean, it's it's tough. Yeah. And sometimes we have, as Mr. Leonard has said, we can't fill all the positions so that then our teachers step up. I mean, it is it is tough. So we all have to pitch in and help support the schools. and and make sure the students are learning. I mean, they, they have, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're not wasting their day as well. So it's, it's um, um, but I think we're better, but improvement always, but that feedback is important. I, that is very important. So right. we encourage that. And, and HR is really good about, sometimes a sub may not want to tell a principal something, but they'll tell HR and they'll follow up and they'll follow up with directors from time to time. It, not often, but if it need, need be where we need to go out to the school and say, let us help you, there's a problem here. So okay. just a group effort. Thank you. Mr. Adams? Yes, uh, Mr. Superintendent. Yes. I saw the plan to initiate this after we vote on it, I guess, in August, at our August meeting. Um, do you have a plan, a priority plan for Warrington Middle and other low performance schools that we make sure if they don't have the right fill rates that we immediately implement this at the beginning of the school year so if they're short teacher teachers i mean short teachers or have a teacher that's out for some reason that we can get sub toots that weren't the middle as required it's a good point that you've raised we do not have that differentiated for those schools at this yeah. point in time so that's, that's the whole 
that's a whole game right there. Dr. Smith, yes. um, <coughs> let me do a couple of things. One, I want to thank Courtney for those 12, last 12 weeks of school. She kept all of you up to date each week. Um, she's brought great information here to you. We'll make sure on Monday at the principal's meeting this is shared with them as well. And our level, level directors will continue to follow up, uh, making certain that those teachers leave lesson plans for our substitutes. But it was amazing as we went through those 12 weeks, and then actually as we prepared to provide finance and budgeting with a budget of increase in the uh, substitute teacher salary. When you go back and you look at past years and the total number of, number of absences that you have in an academic year, I'm not going to worry about trying to tell you all the years previous. This past year we had over 45,000 absences that we had to fill. You say, man, that's, that's a lot of absences. But I want you to think about what all occurred last year. Contact tracing, COVID, you had to stay out for 10 days. So there were a lot of things that made that number increase. We hope to be able to get back to some type of normalcy. And when I say normalcy, I may be talking about 38,000 or 39,000, which is still a lot of absences. But we've increased those numbers uh, of substitute teachers that are in our ranks. We've, you've heard all these strategies. Hopefully the bump in salary will help as well. Um, but I do know in HR we have talked to many principals that are already setting up to have two substitutes at day one, depending upon the size of their school. Some schools are going to have three. Some schools are going to have four. I heard a conversation between the administrators in at uh, Warrington and our um, director of HR about going on and having four or five substitutes there the very first day. And then they'll know after the weeks go on, the first couple of weeks of school, do they need some or do they can they back off? So. That's already in the works at many of our schools, not just Warrington. Chair, I'll go back to my question. Do, do we have a plan to make it a priority for, for sure for Warrington Middle <laughs> and the other low performing schools that they have a priority on substitutes and for this pay enhancement to get, make sure we're fully staffed at that school? Okay, okay so let I, me make sure I, I, I... And I appreciate the answer I got on that, but... I don't know how you can do a priority. Well, you can have the is, is at the beginning of school year. Are we going to have this pilot plan initiated for Warrington? No. Okay, no. so that's and what Warrington I'm, wasn't on the pilot plan either. Right. So they had a better fill rate than um, some of the other schools. Okay, I, I'm only worried because that school has to be staffed. Yes. It's a different than Beulah. Okay, I'll I'll go back to my district three board member but uh the difference the difference i think too with the school well specifically with warrington is we have a lot of resource people yeah, there extra teacher. so they should be able to adjust a little bit easier than some of our our other schools um, but to your point we need to keep our eye on it i mean if we need to do something we'll we'll, we'll do something yeah Mr. Good, Mr. good point Mr. Adams, I would like to say, uh, let you know that I did talk to the, the principal for Warrington Middle. The new one? The, 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 the new one we're voting on Tuesday night? Mm -hmm. Okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> okay. The <laughs> principal elect. The one that's there right now. <laughs> um, but I did speak yeah. with the administration at Warrington Middle, and um, we're actively already um, requesting substitutes to show up for the first day, and I've already had three or four to say that they would go thank so you that's what we'll, i want to do we'll here. have a plan yes we got them <laughs> yeah I, I i'll also add that uh james mills uh with lsi has even said we'll we will jump we will teach yeah. we yeah. will cover so there's a there is a commitment um with that leadership team to make sure we're not losing instructional time because um y your your question is is uh, very important. I looked at your PowerPoint from y'all's presentation, and I saw the teachers were short in ELA reading math, so that's what I was concerned about. That we yes, get substitutes in there. Yes, at least substitutes. <laughs> and and so that hiring process is is continuing. Um, okay. So they're no, so they hired that. three while we were gone. So it's not like mm -hmm. we're sure we're going to be short of teachers. Plus, most of those classes are having second teachers. Right. 
So they're above right now the number of necessary teachers to fully staff the school. So that that's that that extra we got there is to make sure they have a C within a year. Hmm. So that's what well, I want to maintain. The academic is that extra instructional. The academic yes. work that they're going to do is to make sure they are they are at least a C, because we still don't know and make sure everybody understands we still do not have school grades. Correct. Maybe maybe next week. I understand. I understand. So test scores. We're anticipating test scores coming out. In the near future, we don't know a specific date. Um, the only release so far has been third grade reading. Third grade reading. All right, let's take 10 minutes and get back, and we'll start with the superintendent's comments on the second uh, agenda. That was a long ride yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Now you don't have any room to talk now. What time did you get here? Oh, I know. I've been late all morning. All right, Mr. <laughs> Superintendent, we're going to start with your comments. All right. I'm going to introduce Mr. St. Cyr to go over our budget. But before we do, I'd like to read an excerpt from a letter uh, that I received from the Government Finance Officers Association. It says, we are pleased to notify that your comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020, qualifies for the Government Finance Officers Association's Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Mm. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. St. Cyr and his entire division that he leads. Uh, they work exceedingly hard, and to be recognized for uh, this financial reporting excellence speaks very highly of the work that is done daily. And I believe the nickname for this is called the CAFR. Am I correct on that? Right. So if you hear the CAFR, know that Escambia County School District is an A-plus uh, gold star on this one. So congratulations, Mr. Saints. Yeah. Yes, thank you. All right, I understand the best. There you go. Uh, I was just sharing with him after what you and I saw yesterday in the charts from a certain county that deserves more than just an applause. It is a standing ovation uh, for <clears throat> the work in our finance department. Yes. And uh, so, Mr. St. Cyr, uh, I'm sure everybody was uh, feels the same way. Thank you for you, what everything that y'all do. It's uh, fabulous. Thank you very much. And I, let me give credit where credit is definitely due. We've got uh, Debbie Fussell. I think she's back at the office. I was looking for her here. I think she's at the office. Coordinates this whole CAFR effort. Uh, she and I do a lot of work. Uh, at, once Teresa and her gang have provided a lot of the data, then Debbie and I work it over. I do my part. She does hers. And then when I'm through, she just takes the whole thing, puts it all together, and, uh, and delivers it to well, first it gets all, you know, it goes through the audit process. Then we deliver it to two um, entities, the GFOA, which one, which you just described, and also ASBO, which is Association of School Business Officials. Both of those for, and I'm Debbie. I'm sorry if I got the numbers wrong. I think this is uh, maybe the 14th year, 13th or 14th. Uh, I can't remember that we have uh, received the awards from both of those uh, entities. And so I told Ms. Payne yesterday, you know, each time we get this, it's, a, it's more of a relief than anything else because you don't want to break the chain. 
It's kind of like she said the A school thing. She used that as a, as a comparison. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to break the chain. We want to keep it going. So really the relief, and thanks, Dr. Smith. But Debbie Fussell does a fantastic job with all the details and putting it together. Uh, Mr. Chair, just a short comment. Um, when I'm traveling around the state in meetings and everything, your name is brought up so many times. And they use us as an example of a CFO and his staff that run the finances of school districts. But every time I turn around, you're, you're well known, your staff's well known, and great job. Well, thank you. Appreciate that greatly. Now, Mr. Superintendent, that was Escambia County, Florida, and not Alabama? Not Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know nothing about them. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give Mr. Yeah. St. Cyr a jab every now and then. But to be known statewide like that, that's a, that's a testament to what y'all do. Try to keep it like that. I may have to run up there and get a job one day. So. <laughs> okay, let's go over. Uh, I think Ms. Harris handed out a couple things, and then we, we've got it on the uh, PowerPoint overhead. I wanted to give you an overview a little bit. We've already gone through some of this, but now we're getting into the millage part of it. We'll have second FEFP calculation maybe tomorrow, maybe today, maybe Monday. Once we get second calculation, as you know, and I'm going to get into this in a few minutes, that's just required local effort. Then we can figure out what is our millage rate. What do we need to do with millage rate? So I'll get to that in just a second. But let's go ahead on the first slide and, and then we're going to get into some other specifics about uh, capital outlay. All right, so you saw this last time. This is still the first calculation. Again, second calculation, maybe this week or um, Monday or so. The biggest thing here is that negative $8.4 million uh, variance on the right-hand column. That's the difference between fourth FEFP calculation 2021 and where we finished the year and, first, and the first calculation, soon to be second calculation for 2022. So we got to overcome $8.3 million deficit. And here's why we had it, uh, eight, negative 8.3, and then we're going to reconcile back. The biggest thing, of course, was the held harmless last year. That was about a $9 million held harmless, if you look down that column. When that, that went away, and then we had some class size recalculation of, of the class size um, categorical. All of that, plus those increases you see, net out to $8.4 million. So we're, we're in actual revenue now based on actual student population, whereas last year we rode the whole thing on projections and we're not penalized for the real decrease in student population based on the shutdown. Okay? Any questions on that? I'll move through. We saw this last time. All right, pressure points. I gave you this last time, but I had, didn't have any dollars to attach to it, but now we do. Warrington Middle. Now, this is just general fund dollars, not all the federal that we're pumping into Warrington Middle. Warrington Middle, a lot of dollars are going into Warrington Middle. From the general side, about eight to nine hundred thousand. Uh, most of that is uh, extra pay and bonuses for teachers. Um, that well, the bonuses we're trying to replicate that VAM score issue. Some of them will be paid by the state, but we're going to pay the rest of them for recruitment and retention, and some extra pay for uh, oh goodness, I think it's uh, extra days and also extra hours per day during some of that day. Right, Steve? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then we get down uh, instructional materials, new adoption. It looks like we're going to be able to send a whole lot of the increase there over to the federal. We've done that now. We'll see if that holds. Uh, that's a, Steve, you may want to comment. That's a big change, big adoption, very expensive. Looks like, fortunately, we'll be able to send a lot of the increase over to the uh, ESSER, ESSER 2, probably, ESSER 1 or 2. Uh, retirement rate increase, that's going to cost us between that amount, 1.5 and 1.8. 2021 retirement rate increase was $3 million. So we still have a huge increase, but uh, it's not quite as big. Uh, then the other things, of course, are getting into teacher salary, teacher salary compression. Uh, 
and then the other salary increases we need to get into. Health insurance contribution will increase somewhat. That's not been quite decided yet. And then substitute pay, like we just talked about with Courtney's presentation, that'll cost four or $500,000. You will see the increase of the substitutes on the August agenda that was described. That'll be on the miscellaneous salary schedule you'll see it in August. So they'll be ready to start the school. Okay? Mr. Chair, could I ask a question? Um, yesterday at the state board meeting, the, the governor was talking about some additional funds, or was it the commissioner that was talking about additional funds that were going to come to low-performing schools? Have, have you gotten any official notification about that? I have not. Okay. I have not received any. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, for most people, they were going, what is he talking about? I, well, I, evidently, there was a newspaper article that my husband saw, and there were two schools in our county that were named as getting those additional funds, but I couldn't find the article. But I just, hmm. you know, I don't believe everything I read, so. It was Sesser funds? <laughs> Sesser? No? No, it, it, it was, I, it fit. may be where they're getting it, but they were going to distribute it to, <clears throat> right. it sounded like low-performing schools right. that, <clears throat> by an early, early literacy programs and such as that, so. Okay. Not really sure, Ms. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, so, so, so much of this talk is tied up with some of this federal that maybe it is in there already. Um, not sure. Okay. But. Um, but it might be another source of income. But also coming. another one about the reading program that we, I'm still fuzzy on. I think Steve and I have talked about that a little bit. Um, I just hadn't found it. All right, we, we have discussed Odom. that. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir. Let me say, Ms. Odom, did you? I, I did just find something um, that it looks like there are $44 million in federal uh, unified school improvement grant funds that are supposed to go to 149 struggling public schools. Okay. Can you, can you forward that link to Elizabeth? I will. Thank you. Uh, it, it's just a Jacksonville news story, but I wasn't. Okay, that's good. It. And there, it, it does have a listing of all the schools. Okay. Can you can you adjust his microphone up a little, or is it? Are we all on one system? And good luck. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you need me a little bit closer. Is that what you're saying? I'll, let me, uh, let's go to the tax roll now, and I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Uh, we have certified tax roll, of course, July 1 certification by the property appraiser. Certified tax roll, $23.2 billion. And 2021 certified tax roll was 21.8, so the difference uh, increased $1.5 billion. About a 6.7% increase, which is kind of typical over the last few years. So we'll work the tax roll. We just need the millage rates. We need the second calculation to set the required local effort. All right, here's the capital millage. This would be um, what we're gonna be working up once we get second calculation in terms of how much does the district levy. All right, uh, over time, 2018, 25.9 million for capital. That was levying the full 1.5. We were able to levy the full 1.5 that year without a tax increase. Um, 2019, uh, increase, uh, 184, just a little bit shy of 25.9. Uh, that was rollback rate. Rollback rate's gonna get you about the same as the prior year. 26.7 uh, in 2020, and 2021, we levied 1.351, the same as 2020. However, in 2021, we advertised our first notice of tax increase in quite a while. And the only reason we had to do that was because uh, we exceeded rollback rate. We didn't change the millage rate, 1.351. However, the calculation exceeded rollback rate, therefore, automatic notice of tax increase. 2022, to be determined in terms of revenue. However, on the, and Dr. Smith and I have discussed this along with Teresa McCants, we are recommending uh, to levy rollback rate again this year. 
rollback rate for 2022. And we're doing that because we feel that we are adequately funded for the millage uh, projects that we're going to be doing. Plus, probably not a good year to do it anyway. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the thinking there. We've got all the federal. That's going to take a little bit of pressure off millage, but not a whole lot off millage, but we can do a lot of things there. And then in the uh, millage itself, we have debt service requirements <coughs> that we typically will transfer. I'll show you that. Uh, actually, you've got the uh, long legal yellow sheet or legal sheet that's highlighted with yellow <coughs> in certain areas. That's our capital outlay millage projects for first column is 2021. That's what we did budgetarily last year at this time. The middle column is what would be generated in 2022 if we levied the same millage rate, 1.351. So what we'll be doing in 2022 recommended uh, rollback rate, we'll see a millage levy probably, w once we get the calculations, we'll know, that will be somewhat less than the 1.351, It'll probably be somewhat less than 1.351 to get us to rollback rate. Um, if you want to just pr go through this list, you know, through today, tomorrow, and till next Thursday. This is what we've got planned. The highlighted are mainly things that weren't proposed in the prior year. That's just things that are changing somewhat. So um, what we're saying here is for capital millage in 2020, one, we levied and received, we levied 28.2 million. For 2022, at the same millage rate, it would be 30.1 million. However, rollback rate's probably going to be maybe um, a million or more less than that. We can make that up because our debt service requirement is not as great this year. So we don't even have to cut back on anything. We can make that up just because we're not transferring in to debt service as much as we would from capital millage. About $3.9 million difference there. And um, so that'll help us out without having to cut any of our proposed projects. That, those are the reasons we think levy and rollback rate will be adequate for us. Any comments or questions on that before I move on? Okay, next uh, slide is gets into sales tax. Sales tax revenue over time, 2018, 26.7. 2020 was shutdown year. You notice we still exceeded the prior year a little bit in collections, about 38,000. You know, we, we documented where we probably lost over a million dollars in sales tax due to the shutdown. But the other months were so much so good that we were able to maintain what we did in the prior year. In 2021, we have collected 32 million. That's 3.7 million over 2021. <coughs> so it's rebounded big time. No joke. And so we're going to budget in 2022 right at 32 million. Okay, any comments on that? Mr. Fitzko, were you in the beginning on the half cent sales tax? Would it, did you ever imagine 32 million? <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, you talk about a blessing that, that what this oh, has yeah. done for this school district and the, the community support. Um, but again, there are several on the board now who That's right, were Patty. part of the, the watchdog committee, and that initial group. You know, the, the admirals who led that initial group did their jobs and, and made this what it is. And, you know, I think our community is very pleased and very mm -hmm. proud of 
the way things have gone. And how many votes did it pass by? You always like to say this. Uh, the first time it was less than 100. Well, it was like 70-something, wasn't it? I, I, uh, I, thought you, moment, I thought you had that mutton right on the... Oh, I, I did, but at this moment, my mind's on other things. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> please don't ever not take the opportunity to thank people in this community for this. Yep. I mean, I, I, Superintendent and I were talking about... <clears throat> You know, it may get it may get up to thirty million. That's just unbelievable. And you're telling me thirty two. Right. And if you don't know, they're going to build two more twelve story towers on Pensacola Beach. They're already us, though, in design, it, it, huh? It won't come to us. Sure, half cent sales oh, tax. Oh yeah, half cent sales tax. More yeah. sales tax. Okay. I was thinking on the the lease thing. No, no, yeah. no. I'm talking about the half cent sales tax. Those are people that tax. more Probably people tax. that come and yeah. visit and spend money. Yep. Yeah, that won't be part of new construction for us. <laughs> anyway, excuse me. Go ahead. Okay. That'll take up a lot of parking spots on the beach too, and. <laughs> well, actually, these are already. Have its negative. These are existing. One is an existing lot that's never been built on. You can't even park on it. And the other one is the three-story days in is going down, and they're going to put up 12 stories. Right. Wow. I knew that was going down. Didn't know what was going up. Yeah. Okay, the next slide is 2020, uh, series 2020A, COPS. Remember, we levied that last summer, or uh, initiated that last summer. It generated in proceeds $44.9 million. We've spent to date. For Pleasant Grove Elementary, 16.5. This is just, now we've spent more than this, but related to the COPS proceeds, 16.5, that's what we've got charged there. So we have an ending balance of 28.3 that'll be spent, and I've got it spent out in 2022. It'll go on beyond that, but that's the remaining balance to be spent. All right, real quick, ESSER update. ESSER 1, $12.3 million, expended to date as of June 30th, 8.4. So we'll move $3.9 million will roll into the new year capacity for ESSER 1. That'll quickly be spent. Uh, ESSER 2, $48.4 million, $48.5 million. And then ESSER 3, the ESSER 3 date is going to be a year beyond ESSER 2 but about two and a half times the money. So 48 million for ESSER 2, and you'll see the split. We've looked at this already. The split down at the bottom. The state will has carved out the top three, and those will probably be separate little grants. And then the balance of ESSER 2 will be about 34 million. Most of that, uh, Mr. Dennis and his gang have got tied up in facilities, upgrades, and Steve, most of the top stuff could apply to the things that will happen there with the academic portion. Okay? All right. I'm, a, I'm just going to go over this because it's so much with this thing. This is the principal, teacher and principal relief payments. Now, it does not say bonus. It is relief payment. The difference being a bonus is wages. A relief payment is a reimbursement. So that's the way they're getting around this. There's a legal opinion that the DOE got back in May that indicated, it's an international law firm, that indicated that the funds, the way that they have it planned, could meet IRS requirements. Section 139, I believe, is what they had. Could not be taxable income. Okay but they have to meet the requirements. The requirements would be reasonable reimbursement expenses. You would have to, they have to document all this at DOE. Um, what would be reasonable? And there's all these rules for what's reasonable. There's all these rules for what's allowable. And DOE is going to have to do their due diligence to make sure they meet those for the, uh, for the IRS requirements. So the law firm didn't say, yes, you can do it. They said, if you meet these requirements, it appears that you would be in compliance with IRS. Now, our, the problem with this is 
we're being pressured by the state, by the chancellor's office, to do the same thing with our portion, not the, not the state, but the, the district's portion of, of these federal funds. We would need to be, be in the same compliance as the state's gonna have to be. So I'm saying, let's tread um, very carefully on this because there's already a political fight the federal government has told the governor's office that they don't think it's a um, it meets compliance with the intent intent of that American Rescue Plan so that came from the Department of Edu Federal Department of Education so when they do this it really is all on the state it's not we're not in it yet we wouldn't be in it unless we did the same thing without doing our due diligence. Um, and then uh, after Joe Oliva's message came, or the, the feds did theirs, then Joe Oliva two days later uh, is advocating for the districts to do the same thing. That's after they got the warning from the federal government. So, you know, we're, we're kind of in a spot now that we'd love to do this. I know the superintendent would like to do this. And certainly it's something we could do. But what kind of ground are we be standing on at this point? I, I wouldn't want to be one of the trailblazers on this. We'd like to see where we're at, make sure we don't put our employees in a taxable uh, issue. And certainly the district would have a big deal to deal with if we did this too without doing the proper tax uh, requirements from IRS. That's my thoughts on it. Mr. S Dr. Smith and I discussed this morning, Keith and Kelly and I have talked this up for the last several days. It's just something we need to be careful of. But I know there's pressure on the employees for the employees to receive the same thing from district funds. So I wanna see how the state plays out and um, we'll see how it goes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, and I understand what you're saying because it would be after the fact of the bonuses that if, if any legal actions taken by the federal government with the state or possibly the school districts, then they could demand Probably wouldn't be a clawback. They probably whatever federal funding are coming next, they deduct out of that, right? It could be, right? So or, that, or it could be a payback. Or a payback, yes. Yeah. So um, unless we had legislative support, uh, hold harmless. That's about the, I, that's the only way I see without having the risk. Yeah, I think there's just so much uh, that we don't know yet that we just need to be careful. I mean, it may be cleared up within a few months yeah. um, uh, Leonard Dietzen you know our um, HR attorney sent out a uh, memo the other day and uh, he's he puts his well he don't really give an opinion he just kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> no don't do it <laughs> but wait <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that, that's kind of where we're at on this. I just want to make the board aware of where, what we're thinking here, what the uh, uh, issues are, and where we might need to go. Ms. Odom? And, and one of the big concerns, of course, is um, if the IRS takes a position contrary to what the U.S., uh, I mean, the Florida DOE is taking, uh, the employees could find themselves in a situation where... Uh -huh. um, if the IRS says no, this is not a qualified disaster relief payment. This is oh. this is in lieu of uh, it's a substitute for wages. Um, then they may um, realize tax implications that right. they didn't they weren't expecting. Exactly. So it is it, it's it's a minefield. That's a big one. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead. Okay. The last slide is child care early learning relief payments is the same issue here it would be the exact same issue here these are relief payments not wages the difference here is there's two payments of one thousand dollars one is in the first part of the uh, school year and then the second half of the school year would be the other and they're qualified um, based on 
full or part-time BPK and Title I instructors, and there's other issues to go along with that. So there is, you know, the original thing didn't cover the pre-K, non-pre-K ESC, but this does. But, but it's, a, it's a double what the other one was. And that's all I've got. Any other questions? I, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Um, as I look at the ESSER one, and those were mostly um, for safety, health, the, the first dollars we got were, right. were mm -hmm. dealing with that. Um, Remote learning was a big part yeah. of that, too. And, and my question is, um, I had a brief conversation with Mr. Marcanio. Um, I'm starting to get calls from the community uh, <clears throat> about our, our, where we're going to be next come the first day of school. And so I just kind of wanted to throw that out that maybe next month we, um, or, or, you know, in some way we get the information out to families that we are, I hope, are still going to be very diligent in our sanitation uh, procedures uh, that we had incorporated in the beginning, um, that we're not going to see those things go away. Because I think that, you know, I don't, I understand about no mask and all that kind of thing, but I still think we need to keep, keep our level of cleanliness at a very high level moving into the beginning of school for various disease reasons. <laughs> And uh, I know that Mr. Dennis is, is uh, they, they're working through all that too. But I will say we do allocate ESSER funds to the schools just like they have a school budget. They get, we cut them for their, their discretion. So they're not having to use their other stuff okay. to deal with cleanly, you know, whatever they're having to buy or do. Uh, they do have an allocation of this okay. federal. Thank you for that. Thank yes. you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Superintendent. Yes, our next item uh, is in the area of bus transportation. Uh, we continue to have a concern with the shortage of bus drivers. So Mr. Dennis will um, kind of touch on a, a initiative um, and kind of give a global overview of that. Mr. Thank you, sir, and and to the board members, thank you for individually meeting with us last Sean, week. I know it's because of the system. <clears throat> you're going to have to louder. Yes, I can do that. <laughs> I, it's it doesn't seem to be coming in up here, so I don't know. I, <clears throat> well, he's just trying to whisper. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Tenuously telling you about a challenging situation. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. But again, thank you for meeting uh, with us last week and, and adjusting your schedules accordingly. I know it's hard during the summertime. Um, as you can imagine, the prospect of transporting about 20 to 30 percent more students the beginning of this school year than we ended the school year with last year and doing so with fewer drivers than we ended the school year last year is a uh, an unwieldy proposition and matter of fact it's it, it is physically impossible to do what we did at the end of the school year this coming school year with that added uh, onslaught of students that being the case the only solutions are to adjust how we deliver or miraculously miraculously come up with 40 to 100 additional drivers and that obviously isn't going to happen i will tell you that um, well over three months ago, we did not want to be caught without a solution for you and have a disastrous start of school year. So we began formulating a contingency plan just in case and started working on taking our very efficient three-tier bus system and breaking it into a four-tier system. I will tell you it pains me to do this because we spent 10 years getting all of our schools to start either at the same time or closely at the same time. And that took, as I, as I said, 10 years to do so. It is the most efficient way to operate. <laughs> However, when you have a 100 driver bus shortage, it becomes pretty much guerrilla warfare now. That being the case, our transportation team has worked for months refining, looking at the tiers, looking at paired schools, looking at the geography, looking at a lot of things and tried to come up with the least intrusive, least challenging solution that at least gets us the opportunity 
to have some operational continuity and bring our students to school on time without having to do double, triple, quadruple runs. Um, it's been multiple iterations. I will tell you that what it amounts to now is predominantly in the um, elementary area where we have our most and most significant ridership, we are going to be breaking up the start times of our elementaries. As you're aware, we have 32 elementaries. There will be 14 of those schools that are impacted by an earlier start time. Four in our outlying rural and westernly, westernmost areas will be impacted by a 15 minute earlier start. 10 in various areas throughout the community will be impacted by a 35 minute earlier start. This allows time for the same driver to serve two schools during their shift. There are some insidious and I guess helpful benefits to doing this and that is that you know our drivers that have worked so hard and really what they had to do last year just to carry out their mission was nothing short of Herculean and what they did. Um, this will give them some relief in the form of additional compensation for having to run a little bit more time. But we are still seeking long-term solutions for recruitment and retention. What I'm sharing you with right now is operational continuity. It's not about recruitment and retention. It's about getting our students to school on time so that they can have their full allotment of contact time in the schools. We recognize that this is going to be a challenge to the community. Sometimes a five minute adjustment can create a hardship. We've worked as quickly as we could to seek some sense of approval for this change and look to begin communicating with our community early next week through various means. Uh, press release, school messengers from each of the schools. We are crafting specific language for all the messages to go out so we're consistent. We feel it's imperative that we get this message out as quickly as possible so our communities can adjust their, their schedules accordingly. There will be some anxiety, there will be some challenges, but I can assure you if there was any other way to carry this out, we would have brought it to you. We are literally, as most of our community has felt, at such a labor shortfall that this is the only viable solution that gives us a chance to get our students to school on time. Mr. Chairman, if I can also add, thank you, Mr. Dennis, for that, and uh, Ms. Hart for your work on this. Uh, they have worked on a couple iterations of this uh, of this initiative and have really uh, fine-tuned it and made it as streamlined as possible. And and I think the other piece that's important here is our. Um, salaries going forth, our, our wages going forth with our bus drivers. So that's something uh, that the Mr. Mr. Leonard's uh, team is um, on top of and will be trying to move forward expeditiously to, to make some improvements there. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I want to appreciate Mr. Dennis and Darlene for coming up with this plan. Uh, I just want to put the caveat, this plan, what was it, General Patton, about the first shot in the battle, you know, the plan. So <coughs> when we started school, that trend that we have with bus drivers, it's, it's still going to be going down. So that plan is only good about that first week. And then this staff is going to have to continuously modify it to try to even make it better as we lose bus drivers. It's going to be very important. And, in our bargaining sessions to do something on it, especially when you see where the city has moved, where ECUA is moving, and where everybody else is at. Our, mm -hmm. This is going to get to be a real big emergency for this district. Mr. Petsko, anything? I, I had a question. I, I don't know. Mr. St. Cyr might be the one to, to know this more than anyone else. <clears throat> the impending change in minimum wages that's coming statewide by, what, 2026, has there been talk within the legislature and or from the governor's office about what type of funding differences might come forward? I, I mean, we saw there was the thing when the, the governor talked about teacher salaries, the money went into that. Categorical. And, and there needs to be, because this isn't, this isn't, uh, it's not just Escambia County schools that face the same minimum wage 
um, dilemma in the future. It, it's a statewide, so every school district and every employer in the state it, to comply with that. Well, it's easier, not that it's easy, but I think that a business that could then just increase their prices will compensate for that. We don't have that ability to say, okay, you know, you, you need to increase the uh, base student allocation to take care of this. But somewhere along the line, the governor or somebody in finance or at the state level and the legislature has got to start saying we need to look at funding to make sure that the districts are able to comply with this law. No, no one's heard anything along those lines from anyone. Well, I, I don't think we haven't. It's not that we haven't heard it. <clears throat> I, I think it, it's being said all over the state. But it's not carrying, uh, the message is not getting to the top. I think we're going to have to go to our local legislators and, and see where they are <clears throat> and understanding the dilemma that we're in. I think Mr. Dennis told me it's not Escambia County only. Santa Rosa County is begging for drivers. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Okaloosa is They're begging down, for drivers. Down 30%. So it's it's everywhere but I, I at the moment I have to say I don't think they're listening I don't I don't understand how you can continually do what they're doing and so I mean the same frustration I, I guess maybe that we need to speak up in, in the areas that we can to make some people aware for, I know that our local delegation has been very supportive and has done things that, that we've let them know about. And I, I think that we need, need to make sure that we uh, continue to make this a topic of conversation every time we have an opportunity to interact with them. Not a bad idea. Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Hightower or Ms. Dr. Edler, anything? Uh, were you going to say something? The other piece I was just going to add is what Mr. St. Cyr was talking about with items such as bonuses and whether they're federally mm -hmm. allowable or not in, in the state, that can have an impact on, on all that's happening here as well um, with the concept of a bonus with because we, we have to have th that differentiation between general funds and ESSER funds is significant. So, and especially when we're looking at wages because we want to have as many dollars as we can to to address the needs there. So that was, that's been a bit of a curve uh, thrown at us, that situation and uh, where that all fa falls out between the state and the federal government will be impactful to us, I think. I think the only thing with that at least, we, had, when, we don't have a deadline. Correct. Yes. I Good mean, it, with the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, that's down the road. So mm -hmm. maybe time will heal that, I hope. Yes. I mean, the, the superintendent and I've had several discussions about bonuses and about trying to do things, and they've all been shot down. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> maybe more and more we, we will get different opinions. But at the moment, we can't put the district in that kind of liability. Agreed. Yes. It, it would be catastrophic yes. for us. We don't need to be a Hillsborough County. Who else? Yes. Uh, what I'm going to tell Paul is that normally we'll, we'll advocate for an increase in the base student allocation. The last time FSBA had it on their platform, we were advocating for a 3% increase with the base student allocation. That is the funds you can actually use on the blue-collar side, like the bus driver's on pay right at uh, the base student allocation. Uh, the, all right here's how it works the okay. base student allocation like you say if you increase the base you'll increase what's called the base fefp fund funds right. that's the amount of dollars that is that is based on weighted fte the base student allocation and district cost differential that just gets the calculation started so if you increase it by x amount of dollars then your base increases accordingly and it's not, and it's very, it's a flexible increase. It's flexible, not tied yeah. to any categorical. Yeah. So that, um, it, 
back in before we got into a lot of the mess we're in um categorical with the well the shutdown and all that kind of stuff yeah you know we were going pro two or three percent each year i think on i had to you know i'd have to look back on the base student allocation probably i'm gonna say average around three percent increase so it had been doing that and then we had uh some changes the categoricals start shifting a little bit because yes. some of the categoricals, what, what, uh, they're, they're not technically categoricals, but there are other pieces, components to the FEFP, and they're, they're flexible. But some of those have decreased or gone away. So, you know, it's just a combination of the base FEFP, some of the categoricals and other components that really net out to a certain amount. And then you pull out some of the things that are strictly um, – earmarked for certain things and you can see where you're at yeah. so it, it it really is tough to call it's a I tough th bag. i think the base student allocation three percent would be good for this board to advocate to our local legislators knowing that you're going to have the categorical on the teacher side pay and, and and all that so i think that would help right there and we just have to push that message i mean we're short cafeteria workers too i think the last time i heard it was like 70 or something like that is that right? Uh, about sixty-five or seventy. Yeah. Correct. So and custodial we're, workers we're getting, and every other. We're getting really behind on, on, on that side. So that side needs some attention. When I say that side, the blue collar side, the support ed, they need some attention there. Or, you know, we got to have them to keep these school buildings running and and electricity and and food being delivered to students. So, uh, so anyway, when we talk to our legislators, I think that for this board, whether FSB. Hey, he takes it on as a platform issue. That should be our platform issue. It's a three percent increase of the student base student allocation. So. I think it should just be a basic. This money is for educational support personnel. Period. It, it has to do with this requirement <coughs> right. for fifteen dollars wage, and, right. and you needed. You know, I look at the, the capital outlay. None of this equipment could be used unless the people who would use right. it are paid to come in here and do it. So correct. Right. correct. <laughs> Ms. Hightower. Um, along those lines, Mr. St. Cyr, with your other CFOs around the state, could you encourage them to create a calculation for how much it would take each district to implement the $15 an hour rate? Because then we have a number. Um, this is going to cost the Scambia County this, and we're unlike businesses because we can't charge and recover. So I, you know, I think you, it works better with legislators to say, we know we have six years, but we have six years to get to this this amount. Right. Um, and and that way you talk to them about incrementally helping us get there. And does that make sense? Usually that it does get done uh, through finance council. It's a statewide a number of representatives. I've been on it for many years. I'm not right now. Okay. But those kind of things get worked through because the Department of Education is sitting there in the room with you. Yeah. And also lobbyists and other people like that. So there's a general counsel, different things. So a lot gets done. But the, and I'll say this before you move on. The, the minimum wage issue, as you know, doesn't affect just that one low line on the salary schedule. That's right. It creates a compression issue. If you right. take away that bottom or two to get up to what we need to be, Keith, 11 bucks by September? 10. 10. 11 next year, I guess. But anyway, you start taking away these lines and you compress people up against the next uh, pay grade or step pay grade. It, it, uh, it just reverberates through, so it does get expensive. I, I did have a comment on the on the bus. I just wanted to thank Mr. Dennis and, and Ms. Hart because um, it is not just an Escambia County problem that we don't have drivers. Um, and um, so you you realize that it's not likely we're going to get a whole lot of new drivers. Um, and so you have taken the problem you have and created a solution that would hopefully be able to maintain that. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. And I, I did share with Mr. Dennis when he was talking to me uh, some concerns I had. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that we will, 
I know that it's one of our strategic plans to look at tardiness and um, so I want to make sure that we continue to watch for the tardy uh, issues because we had done a, a good job. I think the schools had, had addressed how to work with those parents to make sure they understood the need for their child to be there on time. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that that's one of the pieces that we're going to have to keep reminding. Um, I had one of those children that when the sun came up, he was up, so that's not a problem. But I also had one that if, would sleep until noon if given the opportunity. So, you know, I, as we move into an earlier start time again, it'll take a while to get it back into, but, but I do want us to make sure that we're on top of, of if a certain schools start having uh, large amounts of, of tardiness and not, but I think this is gonna help. We had a lot of that because the buses were tardy last year. We had a lot of wonderful staff that stood on the bus ramps long after their hours were over waiting for the buses to return. So I think that what we're doing is going to help everybody, but I just want us to be very sure that we're, we're monitoring that as we go. Next, Mr. Superintendent, anything oh, uh, else? Mr. Chair, what? before we move off this subject, uh, I do want to make a comment. It's not all school districts in, in Florida. There's some that do pay a higher pay uh, Walton's one of them, I think. There's other ones, so it's it's only the ones that are have struggling to to meet it, meet the demand in their area with the pay. So if you're looking at the city, they moved up 1690 on starting pay for bus drivers. Uh, they can get $18 or $20 driving a dump truck or whatever it is. So locally, we have our own unique situation on who we're competing with. So not all school districts are reporting that kind of shortage. Mr. Superintendent. That concludes okay. our comments. All right, then we're going to move on into the regular agenda. And <clears throat> what items on here for discussion? Moving, moving on, let's see, we're going to have uh, moving up administrative appointments to the top of the list. We, and then any questions on Number three items, minutes. <clears throat> and then we have two items for rule adoptions. Number one is Florida Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. Any questions on the R&R &R book? Mr. Marcanio has some comments. Mr. Marcanio. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I gave each of you a handout, um, and I want to draw your attention to this this document I shared with you. As you know, this uh, document is up for adoption um, Tuesday night. Um, the page I, g I gave you a copy of page 47, and and when you look at page 47 in the document that's linked, <clears throat> we have um, we have some some issues with some text that got duplicated. And this was not done intentionally, obviously. The only thing I can, in terms of an explanation, that I can think of is when this document was saved as a PDF to be uploaded to the agenda, this this occurred. Um, and so I would say that technology is great when it works, but in this case, this, um, this occurred. So the document I have given you to look at is a red markup of where that duplicated text is and what needs to, how it needs to be removed. So for example, the third row down, you see where it says other major incident. Well, that's actually duplicated because that is the first row. So we would be striking that. We would be eliminating the line there where you see my scribble across um, after the second row um, because those actions under first consequence where it says number two, A, B, C, D, S, D, D, they actually go with the over-the-counter um, row above. And so, and then again in the fourth row, physical attack on peer um, would be stricken because um, it's actually the, the row below it. So I've discussed this with um, Ms. Odom and um, her, her consensus is that this is really a Scrivener error, that once it's approved, we would correct this 
and remove the excess text before we take it to publication. So I apologize for this. I apologize we didn't catch it when we linked it to the um, agenda, um, but it was um, it, it's just a technical glitch when the document was saved as a PDF. But there is no there is no new information. Nothing has been added to the document in terms of um, any new content. It's just eliminating excess content so that the rows are correct. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. So basically no significant changes. No changes whatsoever to the content. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. How is this document used and what do these alphabets stand for and are they described, explained, or defined within the handbook? Elizabeth, would you, you need to roll to where? Roll up to page Yes, ma'am. So uh, as she's doing that, I'll be happy to uh, answer your yeah, first right. two questions, mm -hmm. Dr. Redler. So once once the board approves this document, then again we will we would clean up the these Scrivener errors, and then um, our staff works to send this to a printer, um, and and actually hard copy books are printed and distributed to all. Our our responsibility is that it's distributed to all students all K-12 students. We do that by printing a hard copy of the document for our students in grades K-1 and 2. And then in grades 3 through 12, the document is placed on the student's Chromebook, and our friends in IT do that so that they are, it's distributed to them via their Chromebook. Um, so that's that's what we do with it. And it's so, and then at the beginning of each school year, each school works with the students and they have, um, I don't want to say assemblies, but because most of the time the school will use their closed circuit television system to draw attention to the document um, over a, the period of the first two, two weeks really, to talk to the students about the fact that you have it. Here's, um, here's the, big, the big pieces of it. Again, they're not going to go through every piece of it, but as they work with their school and their students to develop those norms and those rules and procedures. They talk about what the document is in terms of their each student's right to a quality education, as well as their responsibility to participate in their education. And then your question about are the what do these letters mean? So if you actually, and I think Elizabeth has scrolled up. That so at the beginning, they're be defined within the book. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They are. They are um, defined. In the book, yes, ma'am. Okay. So who uses this form? How is it used? The book is used and by... is it used? Mr. Slayton? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just sorry, interjecting. My glasses the book is it. used by every teacher, yes, yes, every ma principal, yes. every dean, every counselor, yes, and you hope every student to understand. I mean, it's not just consequent that the, this part is not the only part of it. Elizabeth, roll another page. Doesn't matter. Well, keep going till you find some text. It, it has information about arriving to school on time. Um, it has information um, about drop-off and pick-up area and so forth. Um, uh, who's allowed to pick up a student. You know, there's a lot of information in here about the fact that a person has to be um, listed in our student information system um, by the parents as far as who's allowed to pick a student up and so forth. There's information in here about the grading scale. So it's used by, as Mr. Slayton said, really every school employee. Um, and if a student breaks a rule, most of the time that's covered within, again, just the norms and procedures that the school has published, but all of those are supported by the policy of the board, which is what this document is. I, I, I think you're explaining to me the, the book. I want to focus specifically on this form that, that you provided for us. When I look at, say, little Johnny was absent, was late. And then he went in the classroom and he was disruptive. When do I use this form? How is this form used in terms of that behavior that little Johnny presented? 
Okay, so and I'll, I'll refer to page 40, well, 43, which you don't have that in front of you, but Elizabeth will take us to it. So you mentioned um, a student being disruptive. So on page 43, which is the elementary matrix, right about in the middle, actually about seven or eight down, you see disruption. And the letter A is there for first and second consequence. And so when you go back up to the previous page, letter A says is, is defined as a classroom intervention. So for the first and second con uh, the first and second time a student, an elementary student was disruptive, a teacher would be expected to have a classroom intervention. That would include all of those things you see there. Um, student expectation conference, sitting down with the students. So all of those things are defined in letter A there on the previous page. And then if it's a, if it's a, a, set, a third a, a offense for the same thing, disruption, then those other letters are listed there. And going back up to the previous page, you would give a warning, you would do a parent conference, and so forth. So, okay. Then. All right. Let, okay. So that's what happened on, on the first event. This was the consequences that this child got for the first time the behavior was presented. Okay. Now now he's in another classroom and he misbehaves. Is that instructor who's gonna look at whether or not this child has other consequences? Where is that going to be? See, here's my point. These are a lot of steps to serve anybody. And and I'm looking at how are they connected if one teacher knows about the first event i come along later in the in the school year am i going to be able to find out what this child done what what did he do how is all of this connected to that child so, from day one to the end <clears throat> of the year right when he comes, are you following? What? I am, and that's a great question. So okay. m at, at the very basic level, when a teacher is doing just classroom interventions, all of those things you see listed there, conferencing with the student um, and so forth, um, a student contract, those things are done at the, at the teacher level. But if, if a referral is written, if a, if, a, if a referral is written, then that information is put in our student information system. So if, if, at, if, I, if, we're set, if we're middle school teachers and you have the student first period and I have the student third period and you've done a referral on that student, it would be in the focus student information system. And because that student is also mine, I would be able to see, oh, Dr. Edler wrote a referral, wrote a referral for Mr. Leonard. I'll, pick on him um, for um, and I could disruption. do that too <laughs> <laughs> you know so because we have the same student I would be able to look that student up and 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 I would see that he got a referral from you two weeks ago for the same thing and so then I'm gonna talk to you as a teacher and we're gonna figure out are we seeing the same things and maybe we're gonna have a parent conference together um, so okay. but but the information is available in our student information system Yes, ma'am. And, 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 and my final point is this just basically seems too cumbersome. Uh, if I was in the system, I probably would leave that system rather than to follow or, or well, to not to be able to follow. I'm thinking some of the steps. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> some of the steps may not may not have That's applied. In that. But, but I want but keep in mind, these are really strategies that we want our teachers to use. So Again, when there's a letter A for classroom intervention, you've got probably 10 th different things there. That doesn't mean the teacher has to do every one of those. Absolutely. They're going to do the one that they I, deem best based on the situation. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to drop that for now. Sure, yes, I, I, I agree. It's a complicated, up, it's, it's a complex document. It, it takes a lot to understand yeah. it. Yes, ma'am. But yeah, I, I agree in that regard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Number B, letter B is naming the tennis courts at Oak Crest Elementary, the tennis 
for everyone complex. Is there any questions on that? Thank you very much. So let's move on down to curriculum. We have nothing to advertise. All right, any questions on the curriculum recommendations for this month? Sir. Sir. In curriculum, I just wanted to make a comment on the uh, Scambia County School District Mental Health Allocation Plan, and I found it to be very well done, very well put together, understandable. It worked in tiers, and I wanted to, uh, to thank Dr. Joyner and the staff, uh, Mr. Fina is out there, uh, for, for the work that they did on that. To me, it was very understandable and showed how things would work and how they were woven together. And so that mental health services from K through 12 and across agencies and others that we have contracts with all came together and all worked together. Good. Yes. Thank you. I agree. Anybody else on anything in curriculum? All right, let's move on down to um, finance and business services. Which, of course, includes a long list in purchasing. I don't hear anything. I'm going to move on to HR. Anything? Anything? All right. HR. I, I do have a question on the equity re report. Equity report. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, because I and, and I appreciate Mr. Leonard called me, but I told him I had not had time to really go through it um, at the time he called me. And um, I just wanted to, to make a comment, because right after I talked to you and I sat there and read through the report, I also got notice of an article from Sarasota County. Their, their school board is actually approving their plan um, Tuesday night. And um, they had had some increases. And so I just wanted to make that comment that maybe we could reach out to Sarasota to see what they have done. Because, you know, in the article, it just said they've put in place several, several um, things that they think have, have increased. And I just thought that might be somewhere to, to look because um, I didn't like the fact that we are seeing a downward trend in our um, students, uh, our diversity in our students taking IB and AP. Um, so I thought maybe if they, they're doing something, maybe we could copy what they're doing. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, because it's not in the report, because it's not required, do we know whether possibly some of the reason we're seeing a decrease in AP and IB is because more students are doing certifications? And those are, that's not reflected in the equity report. They don't ask us about certification um, numbers so I think there's one place in there where like they do work speak place, to CTE work, work, but uh, place certifications that now can take the place them, uh, of those credits I, I mean I think that certainly is possible Mrs. Hightower and I'm okay. trying to look at exactly what page you look, might be looking on well, it, it's just a global statement global statement yeah <laughs> no, I mean I, I think that's possible we we certainly have a lot of options for students um, mm -hmm. and I um, think another reason why AP um, and IB is maybe not as, as much as that parents take advantage of dual enrollment more because they're going to earn that college credit, which okay. has a, obviously a financial impact. Um, but we are, we are uh, working on an, an agreement, um, equal opportunity schools is what, is what it's called. And it's, it's with a group that's going to help us 
um, work with each of our high schools to develop strategies to do exactly what this report reports on increasing um, enrollment, especially for underrepresented students in those upper level courses. And if I might, one more question. Sure. Um, I don't remember all of our high schools being out of compliance in past years. Is that mostly because of COVID that the numbers were so in, in, under the fiscal the um, okay. Title IX portion? I'll, I'll try to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll try to answer it. Um, there were some sports that um, in the spring of 20, they had six or seven games, yeah. and there were some sports that were actually canceled. I think that had a negative impact, and we would always we, – we encourage all of our schools to err on having a compliance plan because we feel as though we can always improve as it relates to Title IX. And okay. That's more than likely why you see all of those, but I would have to make certain I talked to Casey. Well, I, when I sure. looked at the numbers, they didn't seem that – no, you would see a lot of them were 50-50. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were pretty close. Which is what you think close, you would like, you know, yes, ma'am. Yeah, 52 to 48, that kind of stuff. But they all had compliance plans, so that explains it. Thank you. On your question on IB and AP, uh, and I'm not sure if we actually have these numbers, Ms. Morgan or Mr. Marcanio, are we seeing an increase in students who are opting to go to PSC? and West Florida for their senior year, totally? I, I don't have that information. I don't have that exact number, but I don't think we are. Okay. Um, it seems to be pretty. I'm just hearing it, and, and that's I'm, I've parents that school. are saying, yeah, they're not in school this year, they're at. I know. Um, a couple of schools have had an increase, but it, it's not anything significant. Okay. Um, I mean, we put all of the options out there, encourage them and, and support them. So um, I'll take a closer look at it. I always despised hearing a parent when I would say they need to take that AP class. And they'd say, oh, no, I want them to have a good time their senior year. We still uh, hear that. Yes, sir. Going, going back to the report about the AP and the uh, uh, you know, courses and things. I've read the same article you did, uh, Ms. Hightower, but I think that what happened is they showed the increase after they had a plan and they did, such as when we had our graduation coaches in the high schools. And I know of at least one of our high schools that plans to do um, through counseling, one of their new assistant principals is gonna counsel to get more underrepresented students to take AP, IB, dual enrollment to get those numbers up. And, and that will be a focus along with the graduation rate. Right. So I think we'll see that too in the future. And remember we oh. had NIMSI for a few years and so we went way up and then yeah. NIMSI yeah. and so we dropped. So we're looking at that, but we have, I think you made, uh, your point was well taken. We have so many opportunities for students too. Right. So a lot of those CTE classes, yeah. they're choosing and these are singleton. So you get, they con conflict, we have conflicts on the schedule as you know, when you have a singleton. So an AP could be a singleton class. And so you, you know, they have to pick between that and something else they want to do. And a lot of them, I mean, we're, we, we we promote it all, so it's it's a right. it's yes. an opportunity, different opportunities. Anything else, ma'am? Oh, I, I was going to say. Well, I think one thing that Sarasota said they did is they they automatically enrolled some of their level three <laughs> people, and 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 so my question is, do we just report the number of people who are in a class, or, or do we report the number of people that are successful in that class? No, we're reporting enrollments. Okay. Right. That's what they ask for. Because I'd rather they be yeah, successful. And your question, successful, is though, are you successful on the test? Because we, we have a lot of work no, to do there, I, I or mean, successful you know, in the class. Because sometimes right, if you right. push a child into a class, right. it, what colleges are looking at, did you take the most rigorous course right. available a to absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah, a C right. in a right. rigorous course as opposed to an A in a not so rigorous course may not have as much weight when you're looking at colleges, but, but I don't want a, a student to get frustrated right? Um, and, and feel like they can't do it. So. And one other quick comment, we, we struggle finding AP teachers too. So we're working on that. So we'll get one and then we lose an AP. And so that's a constant, we see more uh, turnover now than ever in, 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 in that as well. So that's, that's tough. Is that also the same with dual enrollment? 
Um, yes, because they have to, you know, they have to, their transcript <coughs> has to be approved by the college and we struggle with that as well. You know, they have to have so many hours in that content area. So that, that's our struggle. And I mean, we lose great teachers. They go, they have to, mo they move, you know, it's not like they're just getting out of teaching. They're moving somewhere else right. or whatever. And those, that's really, it's difficult to replace those. I know Pine Forest has worked really hard to try to get more teachers on board and, and, and has, and when, and they've had some great teachers come. New, newer teachers, and then they transfer out for different reasons, and out of the, they're moving because of a job with their spouse or something. So that's hard to, to replace. So we work on it constantly. We work with HR, but it's tough. Well, we we would consider giving them an ESSER bonus, but it's against the law. But anyway. um, Mr. Chair, can I ask Miss Morgan a question while she's here? Um, and you may not know the answer to this. Um, is is the the program that's going to be started on the Warrington campus by Pensacola State, does that start this fall? I, I don't know. I, okay. I know Thank that you. there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, Mr. Marcano, do you know? You're referring to the charter yeah. school on the Warrington and that's PSC charter, campus. That's the Pensacola State yes, charter, Mona, right? Yes. Um, no, that would not be starting this fall. Um, okay. Ms. Coots has been in conversation with the point of contact on the other end regarding okay. that whole project and so forth so we're trying to learn what their intent is um, we initially understood their intent to be that they would they were going to be wanting PSC to be the authorizer yeah and but now we're hearing that they want this board and this district to be the authorizing oh. body for that so that was really news to us we didn't yeah. expect that <laughs> um, so again we're, we're so they didn't that. turn in an act they haven't done a, 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 a not not, a not that I'm aware of not that but not that I'm aware of but we expect that to be happening it's my understanding that their intended start date is the beginning of next school year 2022 and when is our application deadline for charter schools I'll let Ms. Coots re re comment on that, but I, I'm not sure that the deadline is relevant Going anymore. Oh, it's not relevant. Okay. Uh, no, the uh, in fact, that was one of the latest legislative updates is basically charter. That's charter right. Schools. I forgot yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever they want. Yeah, whenever they want to. That's right. I forgot. <clears throat> yes, sir. And, and I will share that I've met with um, President Meadows, and that is correct. The deadline, the, the preference is to have the charter application come through this board. And the anticipated start date is not this fall, but the following. Ms. Coots, do you have anything you're know. just dying that, to that say? That is all correct. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Well, we appreciate that. <laughs> and, and they're having some kind of a military family expo. Mr. Marcanio, are you aware of that? Lost control. That the, I'm totally lost control. I saw something, well, I saw something in the paper, was it yesterday? Where that the I think the chamber is sponsoring it maybe somebody's sponsoring it and it had us down as participating so well then I would expect Mr. Holland to have information okay. about that because um, okay. he's our really he's our liaison um, that works closely with Ms. Burgosh but I I'm not aware of that. Okay. Well, along did you have lines, anything you want to say? I do. <laughs> along those lines, I'd like to ask where we are with the MOU for UWF for having classes at Escambia High School. So I can I can speak on that, sir. I have a meeting set up with the university to rekindle that conversation, as I mentioned, and I think that's next week, as a matter of fact. Awesome. As I mentioned to you, we were moving forward with that right before COVID hit last spring, um, two, a year ago spring. Um, the whole MOU piece, I'll just say this, you know, we, we, we approached it initially as the need for an MOU, but that was with Mr. Thomas and his and the reason we talked about an MOU was so that again you as a board would go on record as approving it in concept because we didn't know who our new superintendent was going to be so I'm not sure we actually need an MOU we are but you know because th again that purpose was so that the new superintendent would know that we that, that there was a, an understanding we would move forward with it, but have a meeting set up with Ms. McDuff next week, and then I'll be briefing the superintendent, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue that conversation. All right, well, I look forward to that because that, that will be something that could be in direct conflict with the PSC charter. charter. Right. And uh, 
I know that that meeting, the initial meetings and the things between the district and the previous superintendent and the uh, university president were all on board to have that start. Had COVID not taken effect, it would already be operating. That is true, but I do want to say that I, I, what I am not saying is that I believe UWF is still on board with it. Because, okay. because again, we're going to have a meeting to decide. I mean, we know we want to do it, but I can't speak for them because, no, I, you know, I, because things could have changed in the last year and a half with them. But I, I, I don't, ex I don't expect that. But yeah, thank you. I know their initial reaction was yes, they were 100% involved. The yes, president that's correct. Of the university and everyone was on board. So that's correct. I don't know what would have, it can change, but we we don't know that that's at this moment. So thank you. Moving on to operations. <clears throat> Okay, I'll take that as not interested. Okay. Very interested. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of open. I know. Uh, miscellaneous uh, district wide. Well, it, uh, you know, and <laughs> thing anywhere. <laughs> and who wants to talk about ESSER funds? I don't know. I don't. And this. We had this turning about. All right. Let's see. Anything <laughs> else? Let's see. We have an item. Um, Scamby County Public School Foundation. Board of Director nominees is up. Before that, we have an item from the board. Oh, well, that's not it in blue. Selection of school board member to serve on the Early Learning Coalition. Who's presently serving? You are. You certainly can. I believe it's important. In fact, it's important to me when I make a commitment to be able to fulfill that commitment. The uh, Learning Coalition provides a very valuable services to our children here in this community, especially at a very young age. I have not been able to attend their board meetings like I believe that I should. I left a message the other day for Mr. Watson, the, the director there, uh, but he has not returned my call. I wanted to discuss my decision with him before I brought it to the board, but I believe that it's more important to get somebody from from the board to represent us. And so that's the reason for um, this this item on the agenda that that I wish to resign and somebody else be appointed. Those meetings normally held. Well, I think they have them like 10 o'clock and, uh, and I believe and that it was just before our three o'clock and then okay. I may have had another meeting and so it was like a sandwich in there that I could never fulfill. I, I know it's it's a, cer it's a certain date of the month, isn't it? Is it monthly, is it? It's a monthly, usually it's a monthly yeah. meeting because I've served on it before, but I, I would, I'm, I'm not gonna put my name forward because I think eventually there could be a conflict with right. them asking for oh, funds yeah, and yeah. the other one that I'm, serve on see, they did have the meetings at 5 30 or 5 o'clock mm -hmm. when i first got on there and i was able to meet those okay elizabeth would you make sure we have the right information about when the meetings are and time and everything before me before yeah. tuesday night in consideration <clears throat> okay and from the uh, general counsel. Um, I wanted to report that Mr. Tompkins um, put out a desperate call for hearing officers. And so we advertised in the local legal uh, paper for hearing officers. Um, I had no responses, but I had reached out to someone who came very highly recommended to me and she has agreed to serve. Her name is Tracy Robinson Coffee. Um, she has extensive experience doing um, child support uh, orders, which are very similar in which um, she'll, she'll run a hearing, um, render a recommended order, which I will then review and then present to the board for final action. Um, so I intend, if, if she meets with your approval, um, I intend to invite her to a workshop so that she can introduce herself um, but I didn't, I didn't want to make that presumption and invite her to be here today. Okay, so there will be a recommendation. Yes. Well, because when I click that link, I don't get anything. 
I'll get a file thing. Uh oh. I so that's why I thought I didn't know what was going. I went to the the copy of her application. Yeah. Could we could we get that corrected so we can see it, please? I I don't know who would do that, but uh, we we forwarded it on. They will be working. We, on we, that. we will get that sorted out, but okay, thank yes, you. we'll take care of that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Anything else, Mr. Superintendent? Anything from you, sir? No, I do not have any additional items. Mr. Chairman? Don't you want to brag about your good performance yesterday? <laughs> we were excited about our uh, presentation on behalf of Warrington Middle School to the State Board of Education. Um, we were able to go through the presentation and addr address three items, the principal position, the external operator, and the hiring uh, process for the required teachers that the State Board had asked us to do. And uh, we received one, one question. Um, there were no conditions or stipulations. The plan was approved as presented. So we have direction and we'll continue to move forward uh, with, with our plan that we have for Warrington. And there's, I think, a good bit of excitement about the coming year for yes. that school. Yeah, it was. It was very exciting. And like I said, during our time on the road, <clears throat> they were actually able to hire three, three additional staff members. I'm not sure what the number is that they're still trying to. They're filling in some extra positions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Probably the only area I know that was really, they're really looking for is science. And they're needing some science. And the, the stipulations that we have are, they're pretty tough. You've yes. got to have people now. We we did avoid the questions on VAM scores because nobody else has VAM scores but Florida. And uh, so that stipulation was not put in that they have to have one. So we were able to keep them, and we'll see if we can steal some others from some other places but they're they're busily every day interviewing i think they said they've interviewed over 80 people yes yep hired uh, hypothetically what happens if we don't approve the principal that's coming forward hypothetically you may end up doing it yourself <laughs> he doesn't have the right well, you experience want you don't think he's you don't think he's not a turnaround person he's not, <laughs> he's he's not, not okay no. he's, he doesn't issue. have it you want local I, control I did want to see if, I know this is putting Mr. Leonard on the spot, but, you know, as I was visiting some of my principals, they're all still looking for people. Mm -hmm. yes. So. Right. Yeah. Yes, I, that's, that's very true. And but, if I, oh, go ahead. No, I, I got something after y'all finish this. I, I was just going to say that as we presented, uh, our chairman started things off. I, I covered a couple uh, points. Um, James Mills from LSI presented some, and then Denny Wilson finished up. Um, our fantastic school board attorney made the trek as well and was there. So it was it was just a, a, a really a cohesive uh, group to present. And I think, uh, I, I certainly can't speak on their behalf, but I'm, I'm sure they were appreciative of um, Chair, Mr. Chairman, certainly you being there and the, the work that's been invested into the direction that they've given us. And I will say to the board members, try to visit the school mm -hmm. and, and see the things going on. But it's very exciting. I have to compliment and thank uh, the operations, Mr. Dennis and his crew. They have been out there busily doing a lot of different things. We've even come up with ideas on the way back of, can we spend ESSER dollars on this? And can yes. we spend ESSER dollars on that? Um, but not only for Warrington, because other schools, uh, especially our middle schools. Yes. That what can we do to make them feel special? Maybe make them look like Miss Payne's old school. <laughs> uh, but uh, that makes kids feel special. 
It does. It's good for them. And so we, we're questioning, can we do some things still all along the year to make each, each of it more important and emphasize to the students, you're in a special place and uh, we have a lot of faith in you and we're going to stick with you and we want you to do well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. Because the last community conversation meeting that's been set up uh, is this coming Monday, Monday. the 19th at 6 o'clock at Warrington Middle School. I'm saying this because if there are people who are watching the live stream or staff who have not been able to attend one previously, uh, the presentation that's been done by Mr. Mills and, and uh, by Mr. Wilson, the, the principal-elect, uh, has been fantastic. Uh, the plan they have generated, what they have going forth, both in curriculum, behavior, uh, training, everything, is, is really uh, met with a lot of enthusiasm. And so if, if you have the opportunity to go, um, and I think it will be live streamed also, so if you can't go physically, you may be able to watch it Monday night. Now, out of the five, I went to the first four, but I will be out of town on Monday, so I won't be there. But um, other board members, if, if you can, the, the support is there. Mr. Mills has gone on, and I'm sure he said it, I hopefully he said it at the state board, in the 61 schools and, and districts throughout the country that he has worked with personally, he has never had the level of support from the district and the board and, and everyone in the community that he has gotten in Escambia County. And, and, and I thank all of you and, and, and I'm proud to be a part of that, this community and to be recognized in that way from Mr. Mills. Um, so again, anybody who can, it is definitely worth your time to go and, and to, to listen to what they have to say. And I'm amazed, but the projected enrollment today is up 200 students. Hmm. 980 from uh, the last meeting that I attended. 82. 992. 992, excuse me. Okay. They announced, because he, right. he said two more had registered yesterday, and it was at 990, I think it was. But anyway, yeah, population is there, and so the community has not lost faith in that school. They are, they're very kids. encouraging. Yes, it is. I think that's very encouraging. So anything else, sir? Yes, yes. You're um, not the sir I was talking to. Um, anything else, sir? No, I'm good. Thank you. Now thank it's you. your turn. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> FSBA, uh, the advocacy committee, we're moving very, very quick. I've had several conversations with Matt Susan as chairman, Tim Bryant of Oklahoma County as vice chair. Uh, by September 1st, we're going to have to have the uh, platform deadline submissions. So I thought I could keep this off for a while off our agenda, but so the next, next workshop, week, I'm going to have it on there. So. I know Paul's worried about teacher retirement. We just talked about increases the base student allocation. I will tell you, we can have local issues for a, a local platform because FSBA looks at statewide and they won't take on some of the local. So if we got things that we, a lot of school districts will have their own local platform that we can advocate for too. So, so anyway, I'll have that on the next uh, meeting. So everybody think of, what you're concerned about, and I'll come along with some suggestions too, okay? Reminding you, the next meeting will be on Thursday at 3, and then the edu because we're back off the four-day work week this week. Starting Monday, we go back to five days, so. Mr. Mr. Chair, one thing I neglected for people curious why we're starting so soon, the upcoming session's earlier this year. Yeah, starts in January. That's why we're having a turnaround yes. real quick now and uh, get our act together for the next session. Yep. Anything else? Thank you very much, and uh, have, a, have a good weekend. Thank you. Enjoy your last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs>